Is that any better? All right. Um, okay, so welcome everybody to the 2023 CESM tutorial. I'm Alice Dubivier. You've got a lot of emails from me. And Elizabeth, who you saw at the, at the front um, door when you got your badges. So yeah, I'm a project scientist here. I do polar climate research. Um, and you're welcome to talk to me throughout the week. And we're going to start today with Cam Brinkworth, who's on the screen. And she's going to talk a little bit about um, how to make this a successful tutorial. All right, to you, Cam. All right. Um, I'm assuming you have my slides up there. I can't actually see them, so <laughs> I'm going to work on that basis. Do you want to share your own slides, or do you want me to share them for I, you? I, I am happy to do it either way, whatever makes Why sense. Why don't you do it so you can control them? Yeah. yeah. Uh, except I, uh, I didn't update them, unless I'm sorry. Oh, that's OK. Um, wait, hold on. I have to share the screen. All right, so let me know when you want to go awesome, forward. Yeah. You, can, you can go to the next slide. Thank you very much. All right. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We are delighted to have you here at uh, NCAR and UCAR and welcome. Um, I'm not going to read this entire thing. Um, the point of this slide is just to point out that we do work to try and create an environment of full inclusion here and um, that whatever your identity is or your intersection of identities, you are welcome here at NCAR UCAR. Um, and, uh, you know, we want you to feel comfortable here, we want you to feel at home, and we want to make sure that you um, feel very welcome here. So whatever you need from us, um, please let us know. We can get to the next slide. Thanks, Alice. All right. Right, so we have three rules for engagement here, okay? The first rule is to be kind, and that is to your fellow attendees, and by that, what we're looking for is we're looking to make sure that nobody feels like you're here by yourself. OK, the whole point of CESM tutorial, it, this is not a competition. This is a collaborative event. We want to make sure that everybody gets what you need to learn. And so if you see other people who are struggling around you, please don't let them flounder. Make sure that you help each other. Make sure you take care of each other. Um, sit next to other folks um, at uh, uh, lunch if you see anybody by themselves, unless they don't want you to sit next to them. You know, we fully recognize that some people need alone time. But please, please make sure that you don't leave people um, alone or floundering. Make sure that if you're going out for dinner that everybody gets invited somewhere, even if they choose not to go. Uh, rule number two is to be kind to your instructors. OK, your instructors are there and they are going to do the absolute very, very best they can to make a learning environment for you. That doesn't mean they're perfect. And so maybe they may make a mistake. So please be kind. Make sure that you are looking after them as well and that they will do their best to look after you. And then finally, rule three, be kind to yourselves. Um, this is an intense tutorial. I want to be, you know, really cognizant of the fact that COVID has also meant that we tend to have a little bit less... Um, I don't know, patience, tolerance for other people in our space at the moment. <laughs> I think it's, people have found it quite hard to be back in rooms with people. So please, please make sure that you're kind to yourselves. If you need to take a break, take a break. Um, if you need to go use the bathroom or get a snack, please make sure that you do that. Um, if you need to get outside, there are some beautiful trails out at the back of the Mesa Lab. Please go and, you know, use them and, and, and make use of everything around you. Um, this is your learning space. Or oh, please watch out for rattlesnakes if you do go out. So just, you know, like watch where you put your feet. But apart from that, it should be good. Um, this is your learning space. So please make sure it works for you. And so if you have to stand up, if you have to move around, do what you need to do. OK. All right. Um, these. Uh, so what I want to be. I believe you've got, uh, received a copy of the Code of Conduct. Um, I want to be real clear that the Code of Conduct applies to everybody. It uh, applies to all of you. It applies to your instructors. It applies to any UCAS staff who are there as well. So please be aware of that. Um, it also applies uh, to all venues and situations. And so whether you are there in the conference room or whether you are out at dinner, from the point at which you step foot off the plane or out of your car to arrive to the point at which you step foot back on the, on the plane, um, you are bound by the code of conduct. So please be aware of that. Please remember, people are here to learn, not to get a date, okay? You are here in a learning environment. Please keep it professional. Um, you are all adults, and so I understand that. So if you decide mutually to do something amongst yourselves, that is fine. Um, but you, are, you can ask once. Um, if you are asking a second time, you're asking too many times. Um, so please make sure you don't do that. And please remember that everybody here is in a learning environment uh, and working. 
uh, say professional environment. So please be aware of that. And then if you need help, you can um, chat to Alice, you can chat to Elizabeth, go can, or you can give me a call as well. I'm happy to uh, take any emails that anybody wants to um, come to us about. We also have an anonymous reporting system, just so you all know, I didn't put it on here, which was silly of me. It's called Ethics Point, and you can find it on the UCAR website. So if you type in UCAR Ethics Point, if you need to make a, a, a report, and that can be anonymous through that system, please let us know, but please make sure you give us enough information that we can actually investigate um, and, and help you out. Okay. Uh, resources. We have one all gender restroom in the building. It's in the second floor of the exhibit area. So if you walk out of that room and you take a right to go up the stairs and when you hit the exhibits, you go left. And so um, it is just there. We also have two lactation rooms. The easiest one is room 250. That's on the second floor. You're going to have to talk to somebody to get access to that. So I'm not going to tell you exactly how to get there. They will tell you how to get there, um, but you'll need access um, there. There are vegan, uh, vegetarian and gluten-free food options in the cafeteria for lunch. Um, I don't remember whether folks um, have um, gluten-free snacks. I believe that y'all were working really hard to make sure that you had everybody covered. Um, but if you find yourselves without gluten-free snacks, then the cafeteria should have some. And once again, this is your learning space, okay? Use it in the way that you need to maximize your learning. Um, if that means that you have to get up and move around, then that's totally fine. Do what you need to do to make sure that you stay focused and stay um, able to listen and pay attention. And I think that is everything. Um, so if there is anything else you need, um, you're welcome to ask questions. I don't know if I can hear you, but you are welcome to ask questions and Alice can yell into the microphone um, for me if you have anything you need. Um, if you want to ask questions, we throughout this whole day, the whole week, we have to give you a microphone so that it can be recorded. So just don't start talking until we actually get you a microphone. But does anyone have any questions they want to ask now? All right, Cam, it looks like there are no questions in the room. In that case, I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful week. Um, like I said, make sure that you all learn the best that you can. Uh, be, be collaborative with each other, not competitive. And uh, I hope you have a fantastic time here. Welcome. Thanks, Alice. Yep. Thank you for coming. Anytime. Take care. All right. And I think they're going to share the next presentation from the booth, which is just an intro from me and Elizabeth. So Elizabeth's here now. I'm going to let her um, say anything she wants to say. And she's been really instrumental for helping you all get the logistics ready to come here. So I hope you all really appreciate how much she's done. Well, good morning, and really, I love my work to, to a fault. I'm here to help you at any time, myself, or we have uh, three admins that will be here throughout the week. So we'll be here during breaks at the front desk. Um, we'll be around when we move to the separate spaces where you're doing work. So really just plug us down, or you all have my email. You can email me questions at any time. It seems like the bus worked today, which is wonderful. I'm really happy about that. And so that will pick you up at that same spot, but at 8 tomorrow instead of quarter of 8. And um, <clears throat> this afternoon at 5 when we're done, it will pick you up at the bottom of the hill, just where it dropped you off today. If you have any questions about lodging, please let me know. And if anyone had their car with them and had any problems with parking, please also let me know. Things didn't work out exactly how that was supposed to, but I'm happy to help. And really any questions or issues, I'm happy to help facilitate. And I hope that you really make the most of this week. So thank you. All right. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to have just a few welcome and intro logistics, and then I'll start um, the first lecture today. But before we do that, this is a little bit of an addition from, from what Cam had said. So welcome to the Mesa Lab. This is the first in-person tutorial that was here at the Mesa Lab since 2019. We did have an in-person tutorial last year, but the air conditioning here broke, so we had to move on short notice. So let's all keep our fingers crossed that it's supposed to, that it'll stay cool because it's supposed to be a pretty hot week here. Um, the first thing I just wanted to start with is a land acknowledgement. So here in Boulder and the whole front range, um, we want to recognize the contributions of the indigenous peoples to this area. These areas were the traditional territories of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute, as well as many other nations that went through here. And so we just want to recognize that the history of the state is somewhat difficult, um, but that we, the experiences and the histories of the indigenous people who have lived here for millennia are important and that we are committed to enhancing engagement with those communities um, locally and globally. 
Um, you, you got in your email the NCAR code of, uh, or the UCAR code of conduct. This is the CGD code of conduct. It's just kind of a reminder that I have up here. But we want to just remind you, and we'll probably try to start this each day, but we value respectful dialogue. So when you're asking questions or you're talking to other students, please be constructive with your feedback. Um, share the air. That means just be cognizant of other people who want to talk or ask questions. Um, if you're working together, just acknowledging teamwork. Encourage innovation, so try to get people to get out of their comfort zone and suggest new ideas or try new things. Um, show appreciation of others and consider other people's new ideas. All right, so the primary contacts, I put this up here just in case um, you needed it, but me and Elizabeth are your contacts this week. And as she said, there are going to be other admins often at the front who you can go to if you need to help finding a room or you know, a bathroom, whatever it is. I drew this uh, nice little map of NCAR. So you came in the front stairs this morning. Um, there's that front desk. So there's a men's restroom kind of down that little hall. And there's also a water fountain where you can refill water bottles. Like I said, it's going to be hot. A lot of you probably are not from altitude, so you should keep drinking water this week. Um, we're in the main seminar room right now, which is kind of up that little awkward half set of stairs. But if you stayed on that front, uh, the, the lower level, and you kind of go past this main seminar room down the exhibit area and then take a left at this hall. There's a women's restroom right there. There's also an elevator if you need it. And if you kind of go around this, um, past the women's restroom around in this circle, you get to the cafeteria where there's also water. Um, if you end up eating outside, you can go out some doors here at the Fountain Plaza and then down some stairs to the Tree Plaza. Uh, you'll have to come back in the front door, just to be aware, but you can go out that way. And then the second floor, if you go up the stairs from this little half uh, level that we're at in the main seminar room, you go up these stairs. Um, some of the activities will be in breakout rooms. Almost all of them will be in here, but the lab activities will primarily be in breakout rooms, or if you're doing a meta scientist, we put those into different rooms as well. So the director's conference room is up those stairs and to the left. You don't have to remember all of this, but we'll try to remind you um, that restroom, the all-gender accessible one that Cam mentioned is right next to it. And then if you go to the right instead, here's that elevator again. If you go kind of past the elevator and around, you get to the Damon room. There's an inner and an outer Damon room, but you just go the same way to get there. The library is kind of straight down that hallway. And then if you take a left, there's a men's restroom and the Chapman room. And so some of the activities might be in there um, as we break you guys up. There's a door that you can use to get outside right here if you want to go hike on the trails at lunchtime. Um, again, if you go out that door, you have to come back in the front door, so just be aware of that and be aware of rattlesnakes. Um, computer information. So I don't know if you've already got this in many of the emails that we've sent, but you should plan to use the UCAR Visitor Wireless. Um, you should see it when you look at different wireless networks. When you try to log on for the first time, it gives you little pop up like this that says you're going to follow all the rules for using it. So um, use that. Some of you might already have the Edgy Roam wireless. If you already have that and you can use it, great. If you don't already have it, we're not going to help you install it. So use UCAR Visitor. Um, while we do the lab activities, we have specific uh, a specific project account and reservation queues. And we'll tell you what those are when we get to the lab activities. We're trying to set these as a default in a file that you will load. But if you have any issues with those, please let us know. Um, and then we already shared the link to Slack. So you can ask questions there of your peers. I'll try to look at it as well, though I won't be looking at it super frequently or all night long or something like that. Um, you can also use that to try to coordinate for evening gatherings. So if you all want to go walk down to the Pearl Street Mall or whatever, as Cam talked about, you can do that. Or you can use it to, if people want to share, you know, you could start a WhatsApp group. But we're not going to monitor a WhatsApp group and stuff like that. Um, so if you need any help, uh, figuring out how to join that and you didn't already, let us know. All right, so the main goals of this tutorial, we have five main goals. We want you to gain a foundational scientific understanding of the CESM model and its core components. We want you to be able to run the model and modify output and use it by the end of this week. We want you to have opportunities to network with peers and CESM scientists. We're not going to force you to network, but we're trying to provide those opportunities for you. We want you to get a better understanding of what high performance computing or HPC is needed for running CESM. And people might use HPC interchangeably with high performance computing all week. And then we want you to feel like this is an inclusive learning environment where you're able to do um, your best and learn everything. So along those lines, I want to just emphasize, please ask your questions here at the end of tutorial or at the end of a lecture. Um, you know, we have a built-in Q&A session. 
if you, we all are from different backgrounds. Some of you I know already run maybe like the land only component of the model or the atmosphere only, whatever it is. So, we, and some of you have never run the model and that's all okay. So we're all from different backgrounds. We have different um, levels of understanding of CESM coming in. But I just wanna emphasize there aren't any stupid questions. I was always the one who'd raise my hand and ask a question in class. And then other people would come up to me after and be like, I also had that question. So the worst that can happen is that you come here, you've spent all this time and money to come here and you're gonna leave still confused. So please, please ask your questions. Everyone who's coming and volunteering their time um, for, who works with CESM is really friendly and willing to answer your questions. So you can ask the presenters, you can ask the helpers during lab sessions. Um, during the Meta Scientist session, we want you to ask whatever, and then you can even ask each other. Um, as Cam said, we want you to feel free to help each other in a constructive way. All right, so the activities we're doing this week, you guys all got the agenda. Um, I wanna point out, so on the agenda, I shortened CL means component lectures. So these are informations about, information about how the core model components work. And then we have um, specialized lectures, which I shortened to be SL, and that's just other topics um, that we think is, are gonna be of interest to many of you. We have the hands-on lab activities. So the first three days, starting today, you're gonna practice running the model, and everyone's gonna do the same exercises. Um, and we, we've designed this, it's kind of new this year, so you guys are gonna have to give us feedback about how this goes, but we're, we've really tried to design this so you can work at your own pace um, as you go through those exercises. Day four, we have some example plotting and diagnostics, and we would emphasize that you should choose the component that you're interested in first to work with, not that you can't do the other ones, but we'll probably break you up kind of by those components into those breakout rooms. Um, so I'll, when we get closer to that day, I'll do a show of hands of how many people think they're gonna go in each room so that we can assign you to, the, to a space that makes sense and we're not like having 60 people smushed in one room. And then <clears throat> the last day, day five, uh, we have challenge exercises, again, for the component you're interested in, so I'll get a show of hands at some point to assign you to the rooms you're interested in. That day, you uh, will really only have time to do the one challenge exercise, but you can do all the others if you're interested as well. Um, lunch, I showed where the cafeteria is. It's kind of down these stairs around. There are signs that point to the cafeteria. Um, and around, so you, if you have any food restrictions, they are very good about having um, different options available, but we wanted to emphasize you're responsible for paying for your own lunch, the dorms that you're staying in, you should have breakfast and dinner covered, which is a huge step up from what we've been able to do in years past. Um, some of the lunch sessions, we have meet a scientist options on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I sent out last night an email that has the spreadsheet of who I've assigned to each scientist. If you have any questions about that, please let me know. Um, and if you forgot to sign up, but you're interested in doing that, please come talk to me or Elizabeth because we'll have to assign you to rooms now because we wanna make sure the groups are small enough that you can really have um, <coughs> a good conversation. Sorry, I, like my throat got dry today. Um, there are also, whoops, Mesa Lab tours, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and that same spreadsheet I sent out, I've assigned people to each group again so that the SIED people have a reasonably sized group. The Friday group's really big, so if you wanna do that, Wednesday and Thursday are still pretty open. And then we wanna emphasize that the shuttle back from here to the CU campus lodging leaves at five every day, so we'll try to end by 4.45 every single day because we want you to be able to get back and get dinner and you know, then you have a good, decent long evening to be able to do what you want. Hopefully you're not just doing more model exercises, hopefully you get a chance to like refresh your brain and because it's a pretty intense week otherwise. So um, <coughs> without further ado, I'm gonna to start today's agenda. So we've done all this welcome intro logistics. I'm gonna give a very brief overview of the CESM coupled system. We initially had hoped that our chief scientist would be here to do that, Gokhan, Gokhan Danabasoglu. And um, he's stuck in London because he is also not immune to flight problems. So he'll be here on Friday to talk to you about the model and kind of upcoming developments, but he just wasn't here today. And then we're gonna jump in. Our first um, lectures today are gonna to be about the atmosphere. And we're gonna start this morning with some of the specialized lectures and then jumping into lab exercises. All right, so before I give this first lecture, are there any other questions? No, oh, okay. All right. Um, give me a second here. Yes. 
Hold on. Will you bring it to her? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a simple question. Will you guys be sharing these slides? Um, yeah, we'll share the intro slides. Eventually, all of the slides, the component lectures, all that will be posted online, but um, we won't be sharing those until probably the end of the tutorial because we need to, you know, we pair them with the video and all of that will be uploaded later so you can reference it later. But um, we'll share these welcome slides and stuff like that so you can have that map available and you should already have the agenda and stuff like that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, Oh, no, I should wait. Hold on. I feel like I still don't know Google Hangouts, even though that's what we're required to use. Okay. All right. So this is the first lecture. There'll be a little break after this, um, and you can ask questions. These are slides that Gokhan put together primarily. Um, so I'm just doing, like, the first third of his presentation. He'll do the last third on Friday when he's back, hopefully. Hopefully all the airlines um, cooperate. <laughs> Okay, so this is just an intro to what global Earth system models are and what the CESM is and how it kind of fits in to that uh, bigger picture. So Earth system models in general, not just CESM, are basically a virtual lab for experimenting. So some of the main purposes that people use them for is that they can provide um, us with a way to understand past observed events. So we want to see what happened when Mount Pinatubo exploded. You can use um, these models to look at what happened in the model and compare that to observations. And, and use um, the combination of those things to get a mechanistic understanding of what's happening and the processes that happen in our atmosphere and the rest of the Earth system. Um, we can also use them to look at past, that could be deep past, like paleoclimate uh, present, and then projections of future change um, and what those impacts might be on different parts of the climate system. You can use it to understand climate variability. So this year it's been super hot. You've probably seen the headlines that are like, hottest day on Earth in 125,000 years, something like that. Um, and that might be true, but here in Boulder, we've been having a really cool summer. It might not feel like that this week. Um, and so, you know, that's probably because we're having an El Nino. And so you can look at the different types of climate variability with these models and how different regions are impacted by climate variability, how likely different events are to happen. And you can use those to make subseasonal to multi-decadal projections or predictions of um, what's going to happen with Earth. And with that, when you make these projections and predictions, you can provide actionable, societal, societal, societally relevant information. Um, I also want to point out that you can use these uh, as a virtual lab for just doing like what if studies. You know, what if there was an even bigger volcanic eruption? You can do that and kind of see in this virtual laboratory what happens. We don't actually have to have that happen in the Earth for you to get an understanding of what would what would go on. And I've seen that with what would you know a big volcanic eruption in the Mediterranean do to um, Antarctic bottom water production around Antarctica, stuff like that, or a nuclear winter, um, if there were nuclear explosions. I hope that doesn't happen either. All right, so how these models work, and this is true of pretty much every Earth system model, at least that I'm aware of, is um, they use physical equations. So we have people go out and observe the world, and they write equations, math equations, that describe different processes in the land, atmosphere, ocean, the whole Earth system. So this shows some of these, like, you write equations that describe how cumulus clouds form and then how rain would fall out of that. You write equations to talk about how winds blow and how that then affects sea ice or the water. Um, we often have processes that are much happen at much smaller scales than the grid cells that we're running on. Um, and so we need to parameterize these. So we write equations that try to describe what's going on but we're not actually resolving every process that goes on in our Earth system models. And the key, I think a key takeaway is no matter how high resolution you use, there will always be processes that need to be parameterized because, um, you know, there's a cascade of energy that, that um, we don't ever fully resolve everything that's going on in the Earth system. So you have, a, you have the globe, and basically what most of these models do is you divide it up into horizontal grid cells. Um, those can be varying sizes. And then... Um, you have a vertical grid, so you have individual uh, grid cells over the whole Earth, and then those go up through the atmosphere or down into the ocean or in the sea ice. We have multiple layers as well. Um, and you, you solve these systems of equations in each individual grid cell, so they're discretized for each grid cell. Um, and what we want to do, what, we, what one of the big purposes of these Earth system models is, is to build on the understanding of processes from observations and highly detailed models to keep improving the way that we're representing the Earth to get better projections, to better understand what's going to happen 
in the future, what's happening now, what might have happened in the past. So models are constantly being improved and updated so that we can uh, better understand these different components of the Earth system. All right, so the CESM specifically is kind of unique in that it's an open source community model. You can get it by GitHub, you'll do that today. That'll be one of your first exercises to download GitHub, download it from GitHub. Um, but it is one of the only open source community models. There are lots of global climate models. Los Alamos has one, um, you know, GFDL has one, but you can't just like walk in and be like, hey, I want your model, and they'll be like, um, no. So uh, that's something that makes CESM really unique, and it's also driven by community development. So all of you, by coming to here, are like starting the process of being part of the CESM community, and we hope you'll continue, and we'll talk more about that on Friday as well, how to be involved. Um, but uh, you know, that means that you can help develop the model, you can help push what the priorities should be for what we should look at in the future. So the overall, uh, sorry, fell out of my pocket, we're good. Clearly I'm, I'm, clearly I'm uh, moving around maybe too much. Okay, so um, the fundamental structure of the CESM is there's a coupler, a central coupler, and that it, it modulates all the fluxes between the different components. Um, right now we have um, the MCT coupler, I believe, but we're moving towards different, uh, different ways of coupling into the future. And then attached to the coupler basically are a land model component with the biogeochemistry um, aspect. There's the atmosphere component, that's CAM. Oh, I should say the land component, CLM or CTSM. The coupler uh, also exchanges with the atmosphere, and that's CAM. And there are chemistry and high tops, so like above the troposphere versions of CAM. Um, there's a sea ice model, SICE. That's what I work with most. Uh, a land ice model, SISM. Um, the ocean model, which right now is POP, but we're in the process of changing this over to MOM. And there's a marine biogeochemistry component as well. And then, there's also river runoff and um, surface waves as well. And what we do is we give forcings to the atmosphere model. So this is things like greenhouse gases, anthropogenic aerosols, volcanic eruptions, solar variability. And those are the things that can change that drive the whole Earth system. So that's really where, um, when we look at past, present, future change, we're changing these forcings and those really impact the atmosphere model and then that will drive the rest of the Earth system. And I just wanted to point out some of the lectures you're gonna have this week about these. Um, so the atmosphere model today, they're gonna to be atmospheric model lectures on dynamics of the atmosphere and parameterizations. Um, Tuesday is kind of the land day, so there'll be a lecture on biogeophysics and biogeochemistry. Um, we have on Wednesday some more atmosphere lectures about the chemistry and the high top, which means the whole atmosphere, so all the way up above the troposphere. And we'll also get a lecture about sea ice on Wednesday. Um, Thursday is kind of like ocean day, so you'll get a basics overview of the ocean model and then um, another lecture on parameterizations, and then Friday we'll have lectures on the ocean biogeochemistry and the land ice um, component. So these are kind of the component, core model component lectures that I was talking about, and I just wanted to show, you know, we're kind of covering all of these, we're not covering runoff and surface waves, sorry, if that's what you're really excited about. Um, so the governance of CESM, as I mentioned, it's a community model, and we also have community-based governance. So we have different working groups, you can see the names of the working groups here. And they all work together to define priorities that they're most excited about um, and what they think is most important to push forward. And this has been happening for about 30 years for CESM, so it's a really long process. There's an overarching CESM scientific steering committee that um, kind of, can, I would say, unifies part of this process. And then there's a CESM advisory board. And Gokhan might describe this in more detail on Friday as well. But we're gonna have some of the special lectures are going to be from some of these working groups that aren't necessarily core model components. So on Thursday, we'll have a lecture about paleoclimate. Um, the isotope model, uh, if you're interested in that, is also kind of, I would say, driven by the paleo sections. So if you are able, I would talk to someone from the paleo group about that. Um, software engineering, the model could not run without software engineers who are amazing. So today we'll have an intro lecture about high performance computing at NCAR in general. And then Thursday, we'll have lectures about how to tune the model and how to port the model to a different machine if you're not gonna use it on NCAR machines. Um, and then two other, a lot of these working groups I already talked about, like the atmosphere model working group, the ocean model working group, those are kind of core components. 
but we'll also have lectures on Friday about Earth system prediction, and then on Thursday, one about climate variability, because those are really big topics that many people in the CESM community care a lot about. All right, so the other thing I want to point out that's pretty unique about CESM is that it supports a range of climate goals through one single code base. And so what we have is um, you could run simplified versions of CESM um, on your own desktop computer. This is not the full model. You can't run the full model reasonably on your desktop computer. That's why we're going to use supercomputers this week. But um, you can run like single column versions of the model, and we'll have a lecture about that tomorrow. Uh, simplified models. You could also run lower resolution um, type simulations on a small cluster if you have that at your university or your advisor has that. But if you want to run the medium or the high resolution versions, if you want to run really long time series or ensembles, you really need high performance computing and supercomputers. All right, so as I said, there, there's one model um, code base for the model. And you can do a whole bunch of different things with it. It's very flexible, which can be good and bad, because it can be give you a lot of options and be confusing. But what you can do is you can run it fully coupled, which means that all of the different component models are active. They're um, you know, running at the same time, and they move forward together in a prognostic way. You can also run it so that almost any of those component models are replaced with data models. So that's like for the sea ice, for example. If you wanted to run a historical simulation with an active atmosphere and active land, you could say, OK, for the sea ice, let's just use observations of sea ice or maybe sea ice from a previous simulation. But it won't evolve over time. It won't um, change in a consistent way with what's happening with the atmosphere. And then as I said, there are idealized model options, single column, um, dry dynamical core, dry dynamical core with idealized moisture. I'll be honest, I don't know. I don't work with those versions of the model. I think a lot of people kind of work with particular versions um, or uh, configurations. and so. As if you're interested in some of these, an important thing this week would probably be to try to find who would be a good contact to talk to about these, because like, I'm not going to be able to tell you much about the dry dynamical core, but other people can. Um, so you have a lot of choices with all these components, how they're parameterized, how the parameterizations in the components are done. And um, we try to support a number of different component sets and configurations. There are some that are not scientifically um, supported, and so you should be aware of that. If you're going to use a version of the model that's not scientifically supported, you have to do some of that um, testing on your own to make sure that it's reasonable. And the last thing I think I wanted to talk about is just um, there's been a huge increase in complexity of Earth system modeling in the past few decades. So um, coupled climate models, or I guess different components of climate modeling, really started in the 60s, so well before I was born. We had atmospheric, land, or ocean models, but they weren't coupled yet. It was really in the 80s um, when they started being coupled, and we added sea ice. And I was born in the mid 80s, so that's around when I, um, you know, came in, in, into being. And then it's only gotten more complex over time. So you can see that this just bridges and gets bigger and bigger. So now the 2010s, and they don't actually have the 2020s on this figure. Um, there's now ecosystems and ice sheet models and stuff like that. So the complexity is increasing. Another thing that's increased is that people have found that it's really important to run a number of ensembles. So I don't know, a decade ago, you'd run maybe one future projection of climate, and you're like, here's what's going to happen. And then people realize, like, oh, wait, actually, we might need to run like 50 or 100 of these. So now the number of ensembles that you want to run um, is increasing in time. We have a lot of large ensemble projects that we coordinate here. Um, but the thing is, when you have more complex models and more ensembles, then you also need more computer resources to run the model. And the same is true with resolution. People used to be happy with like, you know, 300 kilometer uh, boxes, 300 kilometers on each side box. That's not OK anymore. Uh, people want to, I wouldn't say it's not OK for different applications. That might be OK for your purpose. But people seem to be wanting more and more high resolution models. And the higher resolution you go, the more expensive it is to run the models. So basically, we just have this increase in demand on resources that's happening. Um, and it's really hard to balance what you want. So as you progress and you decide you want to use CESM, you have to kind of think through some of these questions. How do you balance them? Is it important to have 50 ensembles, or could you get by with just five? Is it important to have all the model components working, or could you get by with some of them being data models? Um, you know, is it really important to have high resolution, or can you have lower resolution for whatever your science question is? So I can't answer these for you. It's kind of something that you have to think what your science questions are. 
but it is something that's really important to think about as you move towards this coupled modeling space um, because suddenly with resources, not just the computer model time, but also um, the resources for storing the model data make it um, really essential that you think through some of these things before you start long simulations. All right, and so as I mentioned, um, Gokhan is, hopefully he's on a plane right now, but um, he couldn't be here today. He'll be here hopefully Friday. And he's gonna talk more about getting involved in the CESM community and then updates and highlights about CESM2 capabilities. You'll learn a lot about that this week, but um, he'll highlight some of those and the community experiments with CESM2. And he'll talk a little bit about this process as we move towards CESM3, which I think is gonna happen in the next year or two. All right, so I think that's all I wanted to talk about as an intro. We'll get an atmospheric lecture later this morning, but you get a little break first. So what questions do you have right now? All right. You mentioned? I think it's on. Just yeah, you mentioned um, the different resolutions, low, medium, high. Like what's, yep. what are those resolutions right now for CESM? Um, so I work with the, the ocean and sea ice component mainly. Um, the ocean sea ice, the high resolution is about a tenth of a degree. Um, and then the medium resolution is like one degree. And then the low resolution is like two or three degrees. And that's often used for like paleo simulations where you have to run really, really long times. Um, as we move towards CESM3, I think the medium resolution is gonna be about two thirds of a degree. So they are kind of like increasing the resolution as the default. But um, I, Peter, do you know what the, what the land, with the land and atmosphere, the default is like one degree, that's kind of the medium resolution, but I don't know what the high resolution is for those. Yeah, I guess one degree is 26. Okay, yeah. He said quarter degree, so that's like 25 kilometers-ish. For the land, you can get down to like about 100 meters. All right, so for the land, you can get down to sub 100 meters and do like point locations. For the atmosphere, one of the, um, specialized lectures we'll do is talking about variable resolution using the spectral element version of the model. And so you can get really high resolutions in a particular region. And there are some of those that we're going to support. But, you know, if you wanted a different mesh configuration, you would have to uh, do a lot of work to figure that out yourself. So it, it can vary a lot um, by the dynamical core and by the, um, like, the component you're looking at. I had another question. Okay. Just really quick. Um, if we have questions for um, like how to, like on the runoff outputs of the model for Mozart, who do we ask? Um, you'll probably learn some about the runoff model um, through, I think that's mostly done through land. So you can talk to some of the land people about that. Um, it's not, I don't know that there's like a single point contact who's like the runoff person or something like that. So I'd say maybe talk to land first. Thank you. Okay. All right, hang on, I'm gonna walk around. I saw you first. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So uh, I was wondering, uh, I'll still be on the resolution section. So if it is like a, the isotope-enabled version of the CSM, is the uh, horizontal resolution is the same? And also, uh, what would be the um, temporal resolutions? Like, is it possible to be like hourly, or there is a um, to that? So there's, there's, you can get hourly output from the model. The temporal resolution, you set that in your name list, and we'll talk about that, I think, on day three of the lab activities. So you could have like hourly output from CAM and monthly output from um, POP or something like that. If you only care about the atmosphere, you don't have to output POP as frequently. The thing that's really, um, I guess, the, the uh, challenge point is with higher resolution, you have to have a higher time step. Mm -hmm. you, don't out, you, you usually don't output the model every single time step. And so that's what makes it a lot more expensive because the, the higher resolution you have, the shorter time step you have to have. Otherwise, the model will blow up. I see. Yeah. Not literally so it, blow up. It's sort of like the same as the wharf. Yes, like wharf, if I you see. know wharf. Okay. All right, this side of the room. So. Yep. Thank you for, for uh, this uh, good presentation. I think it gave uh, uh, an overview about the model. And uh, mainly, I have two questions. The first one, you mentioned that uh, the, the model has the capability to study the impacts of climate change. Could you please give an example on that? And uh, the second question, mainly related to the evaluation and the validation of the model against uh, observations. 
Yep. Um, so, so the first question is like, what's an example of looking at the impacts of climate change? So what we do is we run the model um, with different projections of forcing. And um, uh, you could look at, we often use large ensembles. Here, I'm going to grab the mic, sorry. Um, and what you could do is look at like, what is the probability of rain of a certain um, you know, uh, rate over Houston in the future? What is the frequency of you know, tropical cyclones that hit Florida in the future? Things like that. It's really um, statistical when you're using climate models. You're not going to say, like, in 2050, a big hurricane is going to hit Florida. You, know, you look at, say, 2050, and you look at what is the probability of tropical cyclones of this intensity um, hitting this region. So you mean that, that, that maybe the impacts may be linked to the climatic conditions only, and, and, and you say it leads to grouping impacts, it leads to grouping impacts from agricultural water source or something like that. This is my understanding. Yeah. So his question is, is the impacts just about climate features only, but not necessarily like the way that humans interact with, water, with those features? Yes. So the CESM model predicts, uh, predicts the climate features, the physical system, there are people who we partner with who then try to use those outputs with, um, I guess, more, uh, what are they called, um, like human-based modeling, how might humans interact with that, but we don't really do that here. Um, and then your second question was, oh, how do we evaluate and um, validate the model? So usually that's done for the historical period, so there are observational data sets that we use. Um, what we usually like to see is when you have an ensemble, you, then you have a range of possible uh, climate states that existed, and we want to see that the observations fall somewhere within that range. We don't expect our model, when it's running fully prognostically, to exactly match any observations because it's, you know, the, the real world we experienced is like one possible climate state that happened, but there's a range of possible climate states. That's the idea of, of the butterfly effect or chaos. You know, like one small change eventually over time can propagate, and that's a reasonably, that's an equally likely future um, projection. And so that's the idea of these large ensembles. And we'll, we'll have a talk about that um, on Wednesday. It might have been Thursday. Um, but, but yeah, so uh, what we do is usually we look at the historical period. We want to see the observations fall within our, our um, modeled range of possibilities. You do want to be careful, too. Um, there's some concerns with, with direct comparisons between a model and observation. So if you have station data from here in Boulder, of temperature for say 50 years, and you want to compare that to the grid cell average, those are not going to match each other perfectly. Any, like Even if you have a force simulation where you tell the atmosphere what weather it should have, and that's because a grid cell is like a, you know, a regional or you know, the, an area mean of what's happening over the whole grid cell. And so if you have, you know, there's a weather station right out here, if you look at the wind or the temperature or whatever from that, it's really localized. And so you need to consider that when you're doing your evaluations and validations as well. So this is why you mentioned that there are some phenomena maybe needed to, to be uh, parameterized to, to be yeah. set up in order to, to improve the prediction. Yes, so some, the question is, do some things need to be parameterized so we can improve the prediction of the model? And the answer to that um, primarily is, is yes. So like wind gusts, we don't dr um, directly model wind gusts, but it is important to be able to understand wind gusts, especially for, for future projections. All right, we have a question over here. Uh, Thank you uh, for the nice uh, introduction. Yeah. So uh, the Earth system model generally uh, incorporates number of processes. And as we go to higher resolution, then the uh, error growth due to fine scale processes also uh, is higher, faster. So uh, for a university-based research system, if we have a standard cluster, what would be the, uh, say, the ideal resolution, atmospheric resolution that we can have uh, to have investigations on the subseasonal to seasonal time scale, any um, any idea? The short answer is I don't know. I think you would want to talk to some of the software engineers about what the, you know, how to optimize a, a resolution for what you need, and it would depend on, like, what on the subseasonal to seasonal time scale do you care about? Do you care about the atmosphere in one location? Do you care about sea ice, something like that? And depending on on what the answer to that is, it might affect what resolution you want to run at. But I, I'm not sure, and that might also be something to talk to um, the Earth system, you know, to ask at the Earth system prediction lecture that's on Friday, I think, because they might have more coherent things to say than I do. <laughs> yeah. Um, hi. Also, thank you very much for a great intro. Um, I, I was just wondering about 
um, whether there's non-Cartesian coordinate systems that are going to be available. Um, and specifically, I'm thinking about whether there's ways to avoid getting a singularity at the poles. Um, and then um, if so, are we going to get a chance to learn about that or get in touch with people who can help us use that? Um, and also, I was wondering if that's available in both the high top and low top versions of the model. OK, so um, I think that you're asking primarily about the atmosphere model. Yes. Um, and uh, I think later today, Peter Luritzen is coming to talk about dynamics. There's a spectral element version of the model that does not have Cartesian coordinates that doesn't have that singularity at the pole. Um, and then there are variable resolutions of CAM that you can run as well. And later this week, Adam Harrington is going to come and talk about those as well. Um, I'm not sure if those are available in the high top version. I don't think the variable resolution is available in the high top version of the model, but I'm not positive. Um, I think the spectral element is available in the high top, but Peter today will be able to tell you more. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, data models um, and yeah, what they're used for. Yeah, so a data model is, um, is basically the model is not running prognostically. You specify what it should be. So I think one of the main examples I use for this, um, there's often a configuration you can run where there's active land and atmosphere, and, um, but there's not that active land and ocean. So the data part of the model is that for the ocean and the sea ice, you specify like sea surface temperatures and the sea ice concentration, you don't let those evolve over time. Um, but the atmosphere, and the, the atmosphere and the land do evolve over time. And um, I think if you do like shorter simulations, that's often, uh, you know, you don't get as many coupled impacts if you're going to just look at like a few years or something like that. So that's often when I think of using those. Um, so maybe if you're interested in subseasonal forecasts, I do think there is value you get from having a fully coupled model, even on a subseasonal time scale. Um, we do the same sort of thing for the ice and ocean, where we, we use fluxes or winds, um, I guess not fluxes, but like wind and temperature from the model, either from CESM or from a reanalysis to drive the ocean and sea ice. And we often do that for making hindcasts. So if we want to run like a version of the ocean with active sea ice, where we also have marine ge biogeochemistry turned on, um, we would just say, okay, this is what the atmospheric temperature was, this is what the atmospheric winds were, and then make the sea ice and ocean evolve over time, and we can see like where phytoplankton blooms are and stuff like that. Um, and the main reason to do that is it's really, really expensive to run the marine biogeochemistry, especially if we're looking at high resolution. And so we say, well, it'd be nice to run with an with a atmosphere that's active, but it costs too much, and so we have to you know, decide what we're going to economize there. Anyone on this side? I feel like I spent a lot of time over there. No. Um, are there different microphysics parameterizations for the different resolutions? And is it, um, op can, is, do they like specify that this is better at high resolution or? Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. This is in the atmosphere model. Uh, there are different microphysics, and you might want to turn off microphysics if, or particular parts of the microphysics parameterizations as you go to higher resolutions because you might start resolving convection instead of needing to parameterize it. I believe that there's some CAM documentation about you know, what microphysics are better at what resolutions, but that would, that would be a good question to ask later today for Rich Neal when he talks about the parameterizations of CAM. All right. Let's see what time it is. All right, so if there are no more questions, I think we have a quick break. Um, oh, we got one more question. Hold on. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, is the model fully deterministic, or are there any components that implement a probabilistic, me probabilistic method to arrive at a prognosis? Um, it's, I believe it's for fully deterministic now, but people are working on probabilistic um, parameterizations. Uh, I guess there are some parameterizations that are probabilistic now that I, th I think there's there's a fire model po option that you can turn on, and I think it's like a probabilistic, um, you know, whether a fire ignites or not based on whatever the conditions are, but I, I don't know of any other ones off the top of my head. So. so then is it fair to say that differences in ensemble members are the result of, like, high sensitivity to initial conditions? Like... Yes. The spread in the mo in the ensemble members doesn't result from a yeah, probabilistic. So most of the large ensembles we run 
are at least partially what we would call a micro perturbation, which is basically in the atmosphere at the very initialization, we just have a round off level difference. So that means like 10 to the minus 14, something you'd never be able to measure, Kelvin. And those changes propagate over time. And we have done some, like, that's what we did for the CESM1 large ensemble, for the CESM2 large ensemble, which you'll hear more about on Friday, and you'll use some of the data from. And they also did a macro um, on uh, perturbation, I guess, which is different ocean states at the initialization, and then from those different ocean states, micro perturbations. But yeah, the initial state um, dependence is pretty important, and changes will propagate over time just from that. Oh, I got one more. Sorry, and thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk about um, the ways that the model has been used or appropriate ways it's been used um, as boundary conditions to inform regional models. Yeah, um, so I know that some of the CESM projections get used for limited area models to downscale. Um, I, don't, I don't know of anybody off the, t I think some people in the research applications lab of NCAR, so not CGD that develops CESM, they use CESM to downscale and then WARF to downscale, so they use it as the regional boundary conditions, but we don't really do that ourselves here. I think some of the questions you'd have to ask is like how many ensemble members do you need to regionally downscale and um, maybe like do you have, depending on what you're downscaling or doing regional forecasts, like what components do you need? So like for, someone asked about the runoff earlier, um, you know, if you wanted to do a projection of a particular, um, like let's say just the mouth of the Amazon region, you know, maybe there needs to be some, some care put into like, okay, what would the runoff actually be in this region and is CESM resolving that well? Or are there some processes, you know, I'm thinking about from the ocean, you know, some coastal estuary processes that may or may not be resolved well in CESM that you need to think about. Thank you. Okay. All right, last call for questions. I'm really happy to stand here as long as you want. Like I said, you came all the way here. All right, okay. So you guys get a little break here. Let me see what the, um, what the, all right, so. It is 9.13, and we're supposed to have a break from 9.15 to 9.30. This is so perfect, guys. We're two minutes ahead. Um, all right, so please feel free. There's still coffee out front. There'll be a snack at the next break, at the 10.15 break, I believe. Um, but you can go get coffee. If you want, you can go out on the trails and just do a quick little walk to get outside. Whatever you want, and we'll see you back here at 9.30.
Okay, so welcome back after your break, everybody. Sounds like lots of good conversation, which is good. All right, so our first lecture of the day, as I mentioned, we're gonna start with the atmosphere. Um, this is about dynamics primarily, where our speaker is Peter Luritsen over here. Um, he's the wizard of the dynamics cores, as far as I'm concerned. And he is here out of the goodness of his heart to come talk to you, but he's going to be leaving immediately after this for um, a trip. And so if you have other questions after this Q&A session, you'll have to email him afterwards. And he'll get back to you, but after the trip. Okay. Am I good on sound? We're good? Okay. Alrighty, I have the pleasure to give the le first lecture on the most important component if you are an atmospheric modeler. There's gonna be two lectures on this. I'm gonna talk, I'll give you a general introduction and talk about dynamics, and then there's gonna be a separate lecture from my colleague, Rich Neal, on um, physics parameterizations. And it's my intention here to have you walk away from this lecture to just have an idea of what the atmospheric model is about, what we need to represent, and also know more or less what a dynamical core is, which is the main focus on this talk. Um, so I split it into three parts. Um, I'll start out by simply defining a discretization grid, which is, defines resolve and non-resolve scales. I'll give you a little introduction to the multi-scale nature of the atmosphere and then define what we mean by a dynamical core and what we mean by physics parameterizations. And then I'm gonna dive into the um, dynamical core that we used as our workhorse for the last release of CESM. That was version two, so that's called the CAM-FV dynamical core. So I'd like to give you an idea of how that dynamical core operates. It's a very old dynamical core, it's about 20 years old. Uh, so we are in the process of switching to other more modern uh, dynamical cores. Uh, cores, I'm going to talk a little bit about our spectral element dynamical core, MPAS and FV3. We are in the business of global modeling. So here is a, a picture, a horizontal picture of our domain and latitude longitude coordinates as a satellite image. So we're not doing regional modeling here. We have to represent the whole globe. So if we want to solve that on a computer, solving equations, prognostic equations, then we need to define a discretization grid, some, some way to represent the atmosphere that uh, we can code up in a computer model. So here's a latitude longitude grid. It looks like a Cartesian grid when laid out like this. And as soon as you, as you define that, you have already defined a scale in your system. So, Inside of all, all these boxes here, we define the grid cell average value of our prognostic variables. So that could be our momentum variables, so zonal meridional velocity components. We have pressure sitting in there. We have temperature or potential or potential temperature. Then we have all forms of water in the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. So we represent our, our, our atmosphere state as a grid cell average. Don't worry, I didn't touch it. Okay. Um, but I would like to point out one thing. As soon as we've defined this grid scale, you should be aware that our numerical methods are not accurate at the grid scale. And I've illustrated that in this plot here. So this is what's called a energy spectrum. So on the x-axis here, you have the wave number. So on the right-hand side here, you have large scales. And on the, on the is that your yeah, left-hand side? And then on the right-hand side, you have the, the smaller scales. Um, and if you take observations and do this energy spectra, you'll see it has a, a very distinct uh, slope to it. So that's that straight line there. But when we run the model and do the same thing, then it starts tailing off as we get to smaller and smaller scales. So in other words, we don't have the energy as observed in the small scales in our model. So when you are analyzing precipitation or whatever at the grid scale, be aware of that. These are not trustable scales from a numerical methods perspective. Obviously, uh, there's no matter what resolution you choose, we typically run at 100 kilometer resolution, there's always a lot of stuff going on uh, sub-grid scale, and that's what we need to have a parameterization for. So we give the large scale field to our parameterization and then figure out how to represent whatever is going on sub-grid scale. As a dynamicist, I'm a little annoyed that 
people call that physics, that they call polymerization physics, because I was unphysical about dynamics, but that's how it is. So when we have to model a system, we have to know the, the characteristics uh, of the system. And I like this representation here by John Fuburn, who gave a lecture about this many, many years ago here. Um, he laid out the atmospheric phenomena that are important to capture in our models in order to, make, to, to uh, produce realistic simulations. And he laid it out in a space uh, time scale. Here's the x-axis of space from year down to, to this. Oh, sorry, the x-axis is um, the resolutions all the way from like tens of thousand kilometers down to millimeters. And then on the y-axis, you have seconds all the way up to a seasonal time scale. So I'm just going to walk down that line there, which is which is also um, corresponding to, to uh, energy spectra, as I showed you before, but expressed in terms of uh, space and time. So the very largest scales, um, you have the very large circulation, such as the Asian summer monsoon, so tens of thousands of kilometers, seasonal timescapes, so it's very large in both the temporal and, and spatial scales. Many of you have probably looked at, at weather maps where you can see you know, the depiction of the, jets, the jet stream. Again, we call them planetary waves or Rossby waves. So again, tens of thousands of kilometers, long time scales. And if you look at satellite images, for example, the one I showed you before, you'll see the cyclones and anti-cyclones. Again, thousands of kilometer scale, weeks time scale. And then in these cyclones and anti-cyclones, you have, you know, uh, these strong temperature gradients developing called fronts that can be like tens of kilometers wide. They can live for, live for, for many days. And then we get to a huge problem in our model, namely convection. And the challenge with convection is it appears on a huge, huge uh, range of scales, both in, in, in time uh, and space. So you have big tropical interstitial um, oscillations and you have super complexes and squall lines they actually many of them start right here and then they propagate east and east and and grow uh, in size and that's where you get the, the the squall lines for example and then we have turbulence in the boundary layer that lifts air just enough to condensate you know those those mushroom looking clouds that you typically see on on a, on a summer day and again they can they can live from anywhere from uh, from um, minutes to, to hours. And then at the very end of the spectrum, um, we have the turbulent eddies in the boundary layer. So what characterizes the boundary layer is that it's turbulent. It's fully 3D turbulence down there, which is different from most of the, the rest of the atmosphere. And then all the way to the, to the um, right on the plot here, you have uh, viscosity kicking in. So that kicks in at the millimeter scales, so very, very small scales. So that's where momentum is transferred into heat. So we have to represent all of these phenomena in some form or, or another in our models in order to do realistic climate simulations. And the bad news on your model here is it's a big continuum. There's no, no real clear separation in scales here. Everything interacts. So that's a real challenge when we have to model this because we have to define a grid scale. There are two other lines on this plot here. These are dispersion relationships for gravity waves as well as uh, acoustic waves. So gravity waves can be produced by flow over mountains or when convection uh, occurs. And these are very, very small or very, very fast waves in the system. And then acoustic waves, if your equations support that, they're even faster. The reason why I mentioned them here is that they restrict the maximum allowable time step you can take in the model, which also determines how fast your model can run. So these you have to pay attention to if you're a dynamicist who wants to simulate weather and climate. The gray-shaded area, that's kind of our CMIP IPCC models. They run at 100-ish kilometers. So you see we can resolve very, very large scales there. We have done, uh, in collaboration with partners overseas, 25-kilometer multi-decadal uh, simulations. It's called the IHES project, where we ran, where we ran, or if you depict where that is, that's that red line there. So we're starting to get into resolving fronts, but not quite there. 
And then there's a big movement in our community right now to run models at convection resolving scale. So that's like three-ish kilometers. Um, and then you really start getting into the convection area, but you're not resolving all kinds of convection. Those models are very expensive, and it's definitely not mainstream to run them on longer time scales yet. In terms of the model code, we have a very clear separation between the result and unresolved scales. So on the, on the quote unquote result scales, that's our dynamical core. That's where we solve a set of partial differential equations. Um, and then everything else that we cannot resolve that kind of goes into the category of parameterizations. So that's Rich Neal's lecture up there. This is mainly my lecture. The two of them have to be coupled uh, and it's over, often overseen that this is there's a lot of science in, in, uh, in doing that. So one thing is how do you advance these, these guys in time? So there's one method called the process split approach. That means you give the parameterizations and the die core the same state. They advance in parallel and then you sync up the states. The model you're going to run, the CAMFV uh, model, uses what's called time split. So we have the die core running first, and then that updated state is what the parameterization operates on. So each parameterization updates the state, and then the next parameterization feels that updated state. So that introduces another complexity. It actually matters in what order you run uh, the parameterizations. If you're interested, there's, there's some references here you can look at. There's even a, um, a conference series called Physics Dynamics Coupling that focuses on, on these kinds of issues. All right, so throughout this lecture, I'm going to sprinkle in some of the commands uh, you're, you're going to run, or I think you're going to run to configure the system. Uh, so here's an example from the finite volume dynamical core. It operates on the latitude longitude grid, as I mentioned. So the way to specify that you want to run this dynamical core at this resolution, you specify with this dash res uh, option to this create new case Python command. Um, and if you do this F09, F09, then you get the, the, the one degree grid. We have other die cores in there. And again, you can switch seamlessly switch between die cores, at least in simplified setups, by, by changing these commands. So if you want to run the spectral element dynamical core that's um, defined on this oddly looking grid, it's called a cube sphere grid. We should a cube and type the sphere and sphere and inflate it. Then we also have, um, oh, I would like to note some stuff here because this dynamical core is uh, what we're targeting for our next release. And it's kind of a little different than all the other dynamical cores because it operates on a bunch of different grids. So its native net method is, is a spectral element method. It requires what's called a quadrature grid. That's what you see out there on the right. And then in order to make tracer transport more accurate and faster, we're using what's called a finite volume transport scheme that operates on this grid up here. And then it also has the option to run the parameterization on different resolution grids. So it's, so it's quite unique in that sense that you can pay, play around with these different resolution uh, parameters. And then more recently, we imported um, a global dynamical core mainly developed for weather research is called MPAS, Model of Prediction of Core Scales. It operates on this, it's technically called a Voronoi grid. It looks like a soccer ball. It's the most uniform tessellation of the sphere that you can, you can make. And then lastly, we have um, NOAA's operational global, global forecasting system switched to what's called the FV3 dynamical core. It's a cube sphere version of the finite volume dynamical core loosely speaking, um, and we also have the hydrostatic version of that in our modeling system. So we have quite a few dynamical cores to choose between. And I'd like to highlight this because that makes CSM very, very unique. Most other modeling systems do not have this option. And it's, it's been a lot of work to actually create this option. But as mentioned, you can seamlessly switch between all these different state-of-the-art dynamical cores. So you can use that for a lot of science applications. So one is for uncertainty estimation. You can 
swap out the die core, see what the sensitivity of your simulation to die core is. That's an important part of climate science. There's a bunch of simpler models research that's being enabled, so you can run simple baroclinic waves as illustrated in here or other simplified setups. Simplified setups sometimes makes it easier to determine cause and effect, and you can run all these with the different die cores. You can also make apples to apples performance comparisons because you're running in the same system on the same computer. And then if you're a, a nerd like me, this enables numerical methods research because we have a broad range of numerical methods represented here. You know, finite volume, spectral element, and all these different kinds of grids. Okay, so that was the horizontal grid. Now I'll move on to the, the, the vertical grid. Except for the MPAS dynamical core, all the other dynamical cores uses a, what's called a hybrid sigma pressure coordinate system. And it's illustrated on the top here. So it's an analytically defined coordinate system uh, where you weight a constant pressure and the surface pressure here by these weights. And near the surface, B is one, A is zero. So that means your coordinate system follows the surface exactly. And as you go higher up in the atmosphere, you, the Bs there go to at zero. And then you, you, you transfer into constant pressure levels. And the reason you do this is it makes the boundary condition a lot more easier to handle because your coordinate surfaces do not intersect the, the topography of the surface, which makes numerical methods very complicated. But it is, it is being done in other models. Three out of our dynamical cores uses uh, a version of this coordinate system that's called a floating Lagrangian coordinate system. And I'm mentioning it here because it's pretty widespread in hydrostatic uh, models. If you lean more towards the math side, you can read what's on the right side there, but I'm just gonna explain graphically what it looks like. So you start out with your analytically defined uh, coordinate system. But then you solve your equations of motion so that there's no exchange of mass between the different layers. That means if you have convergence into an area, your, your, your levels will expand. Or if you have divergence, you know, they'll, they'll compress. So when you advance your model, you know, these surfaces will start to deform. And the advantage of this is you only need 2D numerical methods because everything is just done in these Lagrangian layers. So it can also make your model faster. And then once these levels get too deformed, you know, then you map back to this reference coordinate system. So that's what's called a Lagrangian vertical system. In terms of uh, vertical levels, um, our different physics packages are very tight to the vertical levels. Unfortunately, we have a large sensitivity to you where you put your vertical levels. Our parameterizations are very sensitive to that. So I think you're running CAM6, you'll have 32 levels. If you were to run older versions, you'll get 30-ish levels, 26 levels. You can go in with, again, these commands, um, Python commands here. You can go in and change uh, the number of levels you're using. However, it requires you to generate a new initial condition. It requires you to recompile the code. That part will go away pretty soon. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, just a minute ago, be really careful because your parameterizations will respond to it and you might need to retune uh, your model. But I just wanted to give you an idea of how, we, how you can configure the model uh, if you wish to do so. In terms of uh, vertical extent, uh, we have several model versions. As you go higher up in the atmosphere, there are more processes you need to uh, represent. So like if you're above 120-ish kilometers, then thermal conductivity, molecular diffusion starts to become really important. You have ionosphere stuff going on, et cetera. Uh, but you don't have to do that if you run a, a lower top. So the model you're gonna run has a top about 42 kilometers, so you, you do not have a well-resolved uh, stratosphere in that model version. We are currently working on an 80 kilometer top, moving up a little. Um, then we have the whole atmosphere community climate model called WACOM. It has a well-resolved stratosphere and mesosphere. It goes up to about 140 kilometers. There'll be a separate talk about that uh, model. 
And then we have a geospace model that goes all the way up to 600 kilometers. All righty. Um, just to sum up, so I've, I've talked about unresolved resolved scale, overview of the multiscale nature of, of the atmosphere, and defined the horizontal and vertical grids. I'll quickly dive into the DICOR here since I'm, I'm slowly running out of time here. Um, so if you want to design a DICOR, you need a set of equations. So I'd like to give you a little bit of insight of what we go through there in order to, to design that system and, and actually solve it. So the most un, unapproximated equation set that I know of for the atmosphere is the compressible Euler equations. Um, however, um, they're very expensive to solve. So we make a series of approximations to make the system simpler and faster when we have to solve it. So we make the spherical geoid approximation. We see geopotential is only a function of distance from the center of Earth. So in other words, Earth is just a sphere. We know that's not really true, but it's close to true. Um, and gravity only acts in the radial uh, direction. Then we make the quasi-hydrostatic uh, approximation. So we eliminate the vertical momentum equation and make it diagnostic. That's an accurate approximation down to 10-ish or so kilometers. And then we make a, a series of approximations called the shallow atmosphere approximation. So we're basically assuming that our domain is just a, a, a very thin layer around the sphere. And that enables you to get uh, rid of a bunch of, 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 of um, metric factors. One has to remember here, you can't just go in and, and change the approximation of the different terms. You, you have to make sure you have a consistent system. And for us, it's very important our equations conserve energy an angle of momentum. Uh, so all of this was derived by Charney back in, 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 the, in the 50s. There's a lot of work going on right now to kind of get rid of these approximations. So there are more and more global models now that are non-hydrostatic, so they got rid of that approximation here. And there's also work on getting rid of the shallow and spherical geoid approximation as well, which is important for the geospace model, the model that had a top at 600 kilometers. We also have to <clears throat> specify what we mean by moist air. What do we include there? So in our model, we obviously have, everybody has dry air. Uh, everybody has the gaseous phase of uh, water, namely water vapor. And, and, and then we need some form of representation of the condensate forms of uh, water in the atmosphere. And that depends on how complex your model is what you represent here. But all models have cloud liquid and quite cloud ice, and our newer systems have more advanced microphysics, and then we also represent grapple, hail, rain, snow, etc. I'm not going to go into this here, but um, representing all this water stuff in the atmosphere gets really, really thermodynamically complicated very fast. And if you're interested, I teamed up with a large group of, of, of researchers, and we wrote a long I think it's 80-page paper really going through all of this stuff. So if you're interested, there's a link right there. So if you make all of these approximations that I just mentioned, and you assume, assume a vertical Lagrangian coordinate, then you can write your equations of motion like this. So this is the equations of motion for the FV dynamical core. So you have an, an, a continuity equation for the mass of air that predicts the pressure level thicknesses. Then you have the same equation, but for uh, tracer mass. Then you have a momentum equation and thermodynamic equation. So I'm only going to go through the, the mass of air, the continuity equation, uh, due to lack of time. But the finite volume model is based on finite volume discretization. What that means is that I integrate my equations of motion over a box, over a finite volume, as, as shown up here. Then I use Gauss's divergence theorem to, to transform this volume integral into a surface integral. That's what mathematically is happening there in equation six. And what that term on the right-hand side here represents is the instantaneous flux of mass into the system. So physically, that makes sense. Now, you, you want to predict what is the change of mass in your box 
It can only be a function of what goes in and out of it unless you have sources of sinks in there which you don't have for dry air. So if you then discretize in time here, this is what mathematically would look like. So new mass minus old mass is equal to the flux in and out of the system. And how you represent that flux, that's where there's a lot of, that's where you get a bunch of numerical methods on how to do that. Um, and I won't go into, into the details here, but the slides are here on how this is done in the FV dynamical core if, if you're interested. So, quite a few. <laughs> so, there we go. So I have four minutes left. <laughs> All righty. So, <laughs> maybe I should mention this now. If you're interested in numerical methods, there's a great book by Dale Duran from University of Washington where you can see how you do those fluxes that I showed up there. And there's many, many ways to approximate those. So I would like to quickly mention, uh, you might be wondering, you know, why, why are we putting these equation of motion on all these weird grids? Um, and the main reason is, you know, we, we've been in doing massively parallel computing for many, many years ago. So about 20 years ago, there was a big movement of, of discretizing our equation of motion on more uniform grids. And why do we do that? Um, the reason is that the, the lat-long grid that you see here, you see that the cells get smaller and smaller as you get up here. So in order to stabilize the model, we need filters to get rid of small-scale um, waves. These filters, they're, they're Fourier transform FFT filters, and they're global. They, they go around a, a latitude band. So if you want to put this on a massively parallel computer, you've got a problem because you have to communicate all the way around. The way to get scalability on a massively parallel system is you only want to talk to your neighbors, exchange information with them. You don't want to do global operations. And the same argument uh, applies to it was written on the previous slide here, to a global spherical harmonic model, like the Eastern WF model uses that. Again, these require global communications. So therefore, there's one more reason, but a reason is to, to really exploit these massively parallel systems. So this is an old plot, but it's exactly the same on newer machine. The numbers just change. <laughs> uh, here's the finite volume dynamical core, and you see as you throw more processes at it, your throughput, it starts to fall over. So you, you cannot get a faster solution by throwing more resources at your problem. Whereas the spectral element core here, you see, it just keeps going, becoming faster as you add processors to the problem. So all of these dynamical cores, spectral element, MPATH, F33, they're all designed on these kind of grids that allow for uh, scalability. And again, if you want more details on these different die cores, I have, the, uh, I have the references here. And all of these die cores, so there's a second reason why we want to move to these die cores. Well, that looks funny. Okay. <laughs> the second reason we want to use these die cores is you can do what's called mesh refinement pretty easily. So that means you can get higher resolution in a certain area of, of interest within your global model. So that's different than regional modeling where we have a regional model, and then we feed the state of the atmosphere and the boundaries of that domain, and then we run our model. Here, you have the refinement within the global model. So you're also solving the equation of motion in the coarse area. And this is probably the biggest growing area of our system is that everybody wants to refine in all their, their different areas. So with the last release of the model, we had a configuration that went down to 12 kil kilometers over the contiguous United States. It's called the Conus grid. And then for our polar friends who are interested in uh, surface mass balances, for example, over the Greenland ice sheet, they need higher resolution in order to get the mass balance right up there. So we have a, a one that refines the whole polar regions down to 25, and then one that goes down to about 12 kilometers, and that really improved the simulation of the, of the surface mass balance. From a numerical, technical, physical 
point of view, these grids are really challenging because our parameterizations do not necessarily work well across scales. They're usually tuned for a specific resolution and a lot of work goes into that. So I think the grand challenge now is to get schemas that seamlessly work well across resolutions. The DICOR works really well. That's, that's been working for almost a decade now. So I think the DICOR side has more or less been solved, but the physics side is a big, big challenge, Ex especially when you get into convection scales. Like, how do you shut off a convection scheme going across this boundary if you go from 100 kilometers down to three kilometers? So you, you somehow need to do that. And there, there's a lot of research going on in that area. So as I mentioned, if you want more details, this book, if you want more uh, discussion on how to put together a model, apologies for the self-promotion, I don't get money <laughs> from this. Uh, this was a um, summer colloquium we had here in 2008, I think. Um, so this is a little outdated, but it really goes through all the deliberations of, of building a, a global model from the dynamical core side. Um, so if you're interested, you can have a look at that. And as mentioned, I, I'm going to not be in town. So if you want to contact me, there is my email. So thank you for your attention. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to run these around to different people. As Peter mentioned, this is your chance. I didn't do a very good introduction, but he was also the winner of this year's CESM Dist Distinguished Achievement Award, and he runs a whole bunch of different international dynamical core groups like the dynamical core model and our comparison group and a WMO group and stuff like that. So if you have questions, this is your chance. You can still email me. <laughs> oh, thank but you if you want the... questions from him now. Yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> thank you for the nice talk. I have a question for these kind of dynamic course methods. Whether the are uh, these uh, all the dynamic method is available for the CAM6 or it will come in the future. If it's already active for the CAM6, um, how can we choose this right? through the configuration or mm -hmm. component choice? And the <laughs> final question is that whether these like dynamical methods will influence the uh, subseasonal to time uh, seasonal time scale forecasting. Is that like big different to like for example for draw the events? So <laughs> thank you. Okay, so to answer your first part of your question, in principle, you can easily swap out the die core. It will work for aquaplanet configurations where you run full physics, but the surface is just uh, water. Uh, and these simpler models configurations, uh, you can run full AMAP simulations. So it means you're specifying the SST, so you don't have a prognostic ocean. You can run that, but you might not have all the data files available that you need. So we're working hard at making all of that easier. And it has become a lot easier, but I can't guarantee it just runs out of the box. Um, FV and SE will run out of the box, and MP has at one degree. But as soon as you start to change a lot of other stuff, then you might run into some issues. They are solvable, but it, it doesn't run out of the box. Um, in terms of Prediction on seasonal timescales, which I think your, your question was, and how the DICOR influences that. Mm -hmm. That is a great question. Um, we don't have the resources right now to just run, do all our experiments with all kinds of different DICORs. Um, we, we were planning on doing an uh, extensive dynamical coin to comparison run here at NCAR, but unfortunately, that didn't happen. So now we are hoping that the university community will be willing to pick up on that because we do not understand particularly well how the DICOR influences the climate simulation. There's, there's a lot of stuff to understand how it interacts with the parameterizations, et cetera. I'm, I'm not uh, sure whether my understanding is correct, but like the different initial um, atmospheric condition, so small perturbation to the initial atmospheric condition will target it can play a significant role, but I must say, uh, the depressing part for me is 
if you just change one significant tuning parameter in microphysics, you get a much bigger difference than the die core. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you for the very nice talk. I uh, actually have three questions. Uh, I will just go one by one. Uh, first one is about the numerical method you skipped. Uh, I know that different um, uh, physical parameters may use different numerical method, but do you have a general idea like for CAM model, like which accuracy or like what kind of order the, the CAM model generally reach like for the temporal or spatial mm -hmm. order, like second or third? Yeah, so, um, Truncation errors and time in the die core have very little effect on the simulations. So if you change the die core time step, you don't see much difference. Um, in terms of uh, the order, so a lot of people show high order convergences and whatnot in smooth problems, but our problem is not very smooth. Topography is <laughs> it's not very smooth. Being, uh, being forced by convection, et cetera, is not very smooth. Uh, so formally, uh, we're third order, but in practice, when you lay it on to the sphere, et cetera, et cetera, we're, we're like two point something order. <laughs> so, but the spectral element die core we have here, you can, if you run around eighth order or something like that, you could, but it will become a very expensive model. So the sweet spot seems to be two point something order. Yeah, my second question is about the floating Lagrangian vertical coordinate. So you mentioned that uh, in that method, actually we can kind of ignore the vertical trans. Uh, I, I understand it, it mean, you mean the mass transport, right? But we still need to consider the diffusion or eddies or turbulence and uh, maybe the heat flux, right? Mm -hmm. For the vertical direction. Yes, so, so um, the, yeah, so when you have, when you have your 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 your, your um, surfaces float like that, the nice thing is you don't have anything diffusing in and out. But every time you map back to the reference, you know then your numerical method would spread out the the variables a little bit, little bit. So you have some momentum diffusion, some some mass diffusion, etc. When you do that, uh, just clarify. Are you seeing that so we if we use the Lagrangian uh, floating Lagrangian vertical coordinates, we can ignore the Diffusion. Is there is no diffusion in different? It, there, there is some numerical diffusion, but we, but we're using uh, third order splines when we do the vertical remapping. So we're reducing the diffusion as much as we can. But in addition to the numerical diffusion, how about the eddies like this? That it, well it depends where you're on the atmosphere. But yes, we we do have um, when the boundary layer. Obviously, you have you have mixing determined by your boundary layer scheme. And then higher up, you have, uh, you know, when your theta levels get vertical, we have like Richardson number mixing in there to make sure that the waves actually break as they do in, in nature. Um, so the, the parameterized diffusion is much, much larger than the numerical diffusion. Now, unless you look in some very specific area where there's really no parameterized diffusion. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you for your excellent presentation. So I was wondering, it's like the selection of the dynamical core does that any influence? I think it definitely does to the simulation of extreme events. For example, okay. I'm particularly interested in precipitation. Yeah. So uh, I was just wondering, do you have idea or have you looked into which of the dynamical cores work well for like hurricanes or atmospheric rivers? Yes, I, I've only looked at, um, like one of my favorite tests, let me back off. Um, when you're running the full model, it's so hard to determine cause and effect. So one of my favorite runs is you run a, a it's called a dry health soiree, so you, with mountains, so you have mountains, but you're just having a temperature relaxation to the, to the um, temperature field and some boundary layer friction. And with that one, like it really brings out if there's noise for, for um, two strong up, updrafts around topography. Uh, and that's one test where I found that that actually maps on to real world simulations in some areas. So for example, like the massive precipitation bias we have over the Andes and the Himalayas, for, for example. In terms of the, of the full um, modeling system, like I, I would love to do, do those kinds of experiments. And yes, at the grid scale, there is a difference between the die cores. Uh, but I can't tell you which one is quote unquote uh, best. 
I'm giving you ideas for research projects here. <laughs> yeah, come visit us and work with us, please. <laughs> Hi. Um, also, thank you. Um, just a, a couple questions. Um, one, are all of the dynamical cores available in the high top model? And then two, for um, high latitude dynamics, it seemed like maybe the spectral element dynamical core would be best, but is that is that true or is there something else that's better? So in, pr in principle, all die cores are available with the, with the high top, but um, the die cores are very challenged when the top is high. They'd, I call it the death zone. There's some between 80 and 120 kilometers, the die cores are really challenged in terms of stability. So the FV dynamical core, because that's our mainly main supported die core, will run out of the box. The spectral element dynamical core, we're getting really close to have an out of the box uh, configuration. Um, there's a specific project at MPA, with MPAS to make it work for high top, but we, we haven't put it onto, into our system the configuration is not in our system, so it won't run out of the box, but there is somebody at NCAR who is running it. <laughs> Unfortunately, the money ran out for FV3, so we, we're not able to support it uh, at this point in time and with, with higher top configuration. So we're kind of looking for, if there are users, if there's a demand, then we'll start looking into trying to support it. So, so in that case, you know, please contact me and, and I can, I can help out with, with setting up such a simulation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have two questions. My first question was, uh, in fact, you already said that there was no an integration between the finite volume and the impasse new. Uh, uh, there was no what? Integration into running the model. Well, the new version, the new version. Yes, they exist in the new version. Oh, so so yeah. then the question will be, how did the test run go? Uh, how did the score go compared to the old one? Are we making significant so improvement? So FV, FV and FV3? Yeah. <laughs> um, when I've done the idealized tests, so periclinic waves, um, there's this mountain test, um, they look pretty similar in, in those idealized tests. The, the other question is, uh, do we have any synergy with the other centers like the European Center, the EC, MWF? Uh, if we have, I'm sorry, I can't hear, any, hear the first Any part. synergy or do we compete with them or do we have any? <laughs> so so as, as you mentioned, we, we're running this dynamical coin to comparison project. So we invite um, as many global modeling groups as we can to come to NCAR and then we have a specific set of, of test cases that the students run. Unfortunately, COVID really killed this project. We were trying to get it, get it back, but Eastern WF showed up, UK Met Office, the LMD group in Paris, uh, the, uh, the Japanese group with, um, forget what the name is now, the Nikon model and the German icon model was there. So yeah, there is some competition there, sure. But we don't walk out and say this model is the best because they all seem to do pretty good uh, across the board. But what we're not looking into is computational efficiency because that's a tough one. So there may be major dif differences there and especially when laying it onto accelerators like GPUs. Um, so, and then the other thing is that these test cases here have revealed bugs in their system. So that might be one of the biggest contributions of that effort is that the modeling groups routinely run these tests and a lot of them have found bugs in, in their codes. So, but it's a great opportunity to have all these developers in one place and interact with everybody. And, so. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, so one of the things you started out with was by making assumptions to the hydrostatic uh, equilibrium case. Um, if you had a lot of computing power, was there anything to be gained by doing a full hydrodynamical simulation? You mean full non-hydrostatic? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, well, if computing power is unlimited. Why do all this? Uh, so yeah, with hydrostatic models, you can run significantly faster. So, so yeah, that's why it's done. Okay, so mainly just for computing ease. Yeah, we, yeah. Uh, but you can make the argument if you're running at a 100 kilometer 
grid scale, there are, there are no non-hydrostatic motions, so why do it? But but yeah, if we had unlimited computing power, I wouldn't even bother to make those approximations. Thank you. All right, I think we have one last question, and then we're going to go to a break after this. Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering about that um, when you have that <coughs> configuration where the resolution is different at over a particular um, region of interest where it's higher resolution. Um, do you save a lot on the computing power requirements? And if so, how much is it is it sufficient if you did that rather than high resolution across the yeah. whole planet? Are you going to be able to move from a large cluster to a to a small cluster, or is it not really that significant a difference? That's a good question. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> like the whole reason why we do the mesh refinery is we cannot afford well, it's very expensive to run the full model. So you get very, very significant speed ups. Basically, you spend all your all your time, ninety five percent of your time, depending what you do, but ninety five percent of your time is in the high resolution area. So the global solution you basically get for free. Uh, so, so that's what it's why it's done. Um, they're still expensive. I doubt you can run this on a smaller cluster. Uh, I think you 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 still need to apply for um, computing time on the bigger systems. Um, but I, I don't remember the numbers on top of my head, but it's, it's, we're talking like 8x, 10x faster than running um, global. Thank you. So, yeah, like you, you can think about refining, like how big, how much of, of the globe does the US take up? And it's not 50%, you know? <laughs> so yeah. All right, well, let's thank Peter. Um, and as he said, you can email him if you have other questions, but now we'll go on a break and we'll come back here at 1030. So you have about uh, close to 15 minutes and there should be snacks out there and coffee again.
We're going to start this with Rory Kelly. He's a consultant in the Sizzle Laboratory. Um, other than software engineering, I think he's pretty passionate about skiing and mountaineering and biking. Um, so let's go ahead. And he's an all, overall really nice guy. And he's going to be around to help in this first session along with some other Sizzle consultants in case you have issues getting onto the computers and whatnot for the first time. All right, thank you. Yeah, so as mentioned, I'm uh, one of the consultants in Sizzle. Sizzle is the, what are we, Computational and Information Systems Laboratory, uh, which is hard to say. So we say Sizzle, which has a little pop, gets exciting. Um, so we're a team of basically people here to help you use the computers, the software. Um, we are less good at desktop support and like personal workstation support, although we can get you to the right people if you have problems with that too. We're mainly like supercomputer and HPC support. Uh, this is probably the most important slide I'm going to show you today. This is just how to get help if you need to contact us. Um, I should say generally, too, like this whole talk I'm about to give, you don't need to write anything down or take notes. If you, I mean, feel free to if you want to, but um, this is mainly going to be not a lot of detail. It's mainly to try to make you aware of things uh, and to steer you towards contacting us or going to our documentation websites if you have more detailed questions. So uh, this is how you would get a hold of us. Um, arc.ucar.edu is sort of the root of all of our, our ticketing system and our documentation. It's also linked from all over the other NCAR and Sizzle websites. You can navigate to it. But if you want to go directly to arc.ucar.edu, from there, these two links that I have circled, docs, um, that's the root of our documentation tree. And help is where you would submit a support request, like if you had some issue on one of the systems. The things we're going to talk about today are sort of the systems we support. Uh, how to sign into those systems, how to manage your data on those systems, um, building software and accessing software that we have, uh, how to use the batch job scheduler to run jobs on the HPC machines, and how to customize your user environment a little. Um, OK, so Cheyenne is what you'll be doing most of your modeling on. And you are the last group of people that will be using Cheyenne. It's a pretty old machine. Uh, it's actually gone several years beyond its expected lifetime due to supply chain delays and things getting our new machine. So yeah, Cheyenne, Cheyenne's an old dog, uh, and it's, it's limping home. Um, but it should work well for the tutorial. Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of the issues we've had with Cheyenne have been thoroughly ironed out at this point because we've had it for so long. Uh, so it's 4,000 nodes. Uh, each of those nodes is a two-socket 18-core Intel Broadwell CPU. So that was pretty exciting seven years ago. Not so much anymore, but there's a lot of them. So overall, it's still a fairly fast machine. Uh, 3,000 of those nodes have 64 gigabytes of memory. And then there's 100 and, or 864 nodes with 128 gigabytes of memory, what we used to call large memory nodes, but that's not as large as it used to be either. Uh, they're connected together with an InfiniBand network. They run SUSE Linux, and PBS is the job scheduler you use to submit jobs. We'll talk more about that later. And then on Thursday, I believe, you're going to be using Casper. And Casper is uh, one of our machines. It's meant for like some GPU computing, some data analysis, visualization, uh, machine learning, things like that. And Casper is an in-house, constantly updated and evolving weird machine. So it's really hard to put Casper on a slide. As you can see, I mean, you know, Cheyenne is very simple to describe. And this is like a $30 million computer. It's a big HPC machine. Cheyenne is like a homegrown cluster of chaos. Um, it's got a, got a lot of resources, but even this, I'm kind of lying to you. There's more to Casper than will fit on this slide, so I just left a bunch of things off. But there are kind of different classes of nodes. Um, there are nodes intended for visualization, and there are 22 of those. They have 384 gigabytes of memory, and these have kind of lower end GPUs that are good for like you know plotting and things like that, not necessarily GPU computing. There's 18 nodes um, that are meant more for GPU computing. So I won't go into too much details. But they have three different types. There's one with four older GPUs, one, a, one class with eight older GPUs. And then eight of these nodes have four more recent GPUs. So if you get into GPU computing, Casper is one of the places you might do some of that here. And then there are 64 nodes that are what we call high throughput computing. These are. Uh, intended for a lot of like data analysis and like model output post-processing jobs. Those are what you'll be using on Thursday. Um, most of those have 384 gigabytes of memory. There are a couple with one and a half terabytes of memory if you have some really large data sets you need to work on. Uh, and then 
four additional nodes on Casper serve what's called the research data archive, which is a bunch of collection of data that you may use in your research at some point. So that's Casper at a glance. Uh, and then real quickly, I'll mention the machine that is going to replace Cheyenne. So this machine is installed and it's operating in early production now for some select projects. It'll become generally available in about a month. So if you're doing continuing research here at NCAR over you know, the next few years, this is the machine you'll actually end up using. It's called Derecho. Um, it's a, a Cray HPE machine. Uh, it's about three and a half times the speed of Cheyenne in practice, so like based on the actual model CESM and things we use to benchmark it. It's about three and a half times uh, Cheyenne. 2,400 nodes, but there are many, many more cores on a node, so there's actually 128 cores on each of those nodes. And there's also 82 GPU nodes, and the GPU nodes have four GPUs each. So again, we don't, you won't be using this, but it's just to make you aware that this will be our HPC machine here in a month or two. Uh, Cheyenne will live till the end of the year, but it gets turned off, so it won't go beyond 2023. Okay, so how do you access these systems? The primary way people access these is via a terminal uh, using the SSH command. Many of you have probably done that at some point. The syntax for that, uh, whatever your terminal choice is, or is just SSH. We recommend this dash XY. That's the most flexible way to forward X windows. X windows, if you see my little googly eyes over my terminal graphic there, that's just a way to display graphics back from the servers. Um, it's actually probably our least favorite way, but it's kind of the default way. Uh, it's a little janky, though. So you enable it with those dash XY flags, but I'm going to give you some alternatives that I find more useful for doing that. So once you SSH in like that, you'll be prompted uh, for a password. Hopefully you've all, I think as part of the homework, you were supposed to try this out and make sure you could authenticate with Duo. So you'll enter a password, and it'll give you a push notification to your phone, and you accept the push notification. Every once in a while, people have some trouble with receiving push notifications here if the Wi-Fi is busy or you don't get a good signal. So there's an alternative way to do that. Um, so if you're having trouble connecting, I guess let me know and we'll, we'll walk you through the alternative way to do that. OK, then, then the other way to access a system that's very popular these days is Jupyter Hub. And I think that's how you'll be using Casper on Thursday as well. So quickly, how you log into Jupyter Hub here. Uh, when you go to our root Jupyter Hub service page, that's jupyterhub.hpc.ucar.edu. You want to click on the production Jupyter Hub server. Um, there's a nightly build uh, that might have some features you want. So like if you've requested some, some addition to Jupyter Hub, we will usually put it in that nightly build. It'll be there for a while, but it might not be stable. So use production unless you have some good reason not, reason not to. Um, same thing, you use the same password and duo authentication to log into Jupyter Hub. When you're there, uh, you probably, some of you might have a server running. If you have a server running, you can just you know, connect to the existing one. But if you have to start one, um, default, you can name your server if you're going to be using more than one for multiple purposes. But you can just start the default one. And then you'll be given a lot of options um, about which machine you want to connect to, Cheyenne or Casper, and then batch or a login node. For what you're going to want to do on Thursday, you're going to want to select a Casper PBS batch node. And then probably the only other important thing after you make that choice on Thursday, you'll be, normally you enter the queue you want here and you would probably use the regular queue. That's kind of the standard option. But on Thursday, you'll be using a reservation. So you're going to enter, enter that code. Uh, you don't need to write it down. It'll be mentioned again on Thursday. Um, and then the, the charging account too for this project, you'll use the UESM0012 account. And then you'll get more instructions on Thursday about any other options you need to put in here. Once you connect, there's a bunch of applications. Uh, I think you'll probably have some notebooks prepared for you on Thursday, so you'll be able to open them up from that interface. One other thing you can do here, though, well, you can do a lot of things from here, but one other thing that might be useful to you is you can connect uh, directly to a terminal session here, too. So if you don't have, like, a terminal installed on your laptop and you want to connect to Cheyenne, you can do it through a web browser via JupyterHub, too. So that might be handy. Okay, and like I mentioned, X Windows is kind of the standard since the 1970s of like how to display graphics back, but it's uh, it's pretty slow and error prone these days. So here are some alternatives that I like. Uh, one we support is VNC. Um, so VNC, like if you're actually doing remote visualization, it's much faster if you're doing OpenGL or something. Uh, so we have um, we recommend using Tiger VNC, but this client will work with other popular things like Turbo VNC. And the way you would do this is to SSH in, and then we have a program called VNC Manager, or VNC MGR is how it appears. So you would type that, 
And you can either say BNC MGR create dash A with the project code you want. And then it'll walk you through how to connect to the session it creates. Uh, if you want to interactively answer some questions too, you can just type VNC MGR and then it will walk you through starting a new session. Uh, another alternative to that is FastX. FastX you can do through a browser. Uh, you would go to fastx.ucar.edu. You can connect. The, you know, the fastest way is if you're on the local network here or on the VPN, then you can just go to your web browser to that address and connect that way. You can also tunnel via SSH. We have some instructions on that on our website. Like if you're not local to NCAR and you don't have the VPN installed, you can still use this, but you just have to do a couple more steps to go over an SSH tunnel. And also, uh, you know, JupyterHub is pretty good for displaying quick plots too. So if you've got run some analysis and plotted something, if you don't want to open up another program to display a graph back, you just want to quickly look at a graphic. Typically, you can just, anything a web browser can handle, you can usually just click on in JupyterHub and it'll show you your plot too. So, Okay, and then just a general note about these servers. Um, you know, they're, they're pretty beefy in terms of their compute capacity, but they have a limited number of login nodes. Like Cheyenne has 4,000 compute nodes, but only six login nodes. Those are shared between everybody at NCAR doing work. So login node activity should be pretty light. You don't want to like run a model or do something heavy duty uh, computationally on a login node. So we ask you to limit your usage to sort of like reading, reading and editing files, of course, is fine. Compiling small programs, you know, things that are going to compile in a few minutes is fine. Um, doing data transfer between systems uh, is acceptable usage and interacting with PBS. Those are, those are all fine ways to use the system. Just don't run, try to run like a large model or kick off some big post-processing script on these login nodes. There are uh, some automated scripts that if you start using too many resources, they'll end up killing your jobs. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the data spaces we have. So they're all kind of prefixed by this Glade and Glade is kind of an acronym from about a decade now that meant globally, access globally accessible data environment. It's called that because Glade is mounted across all of our machines. That's kind of good, kind of bad. Um, it's nice because all your data is available from everywhere, but it also can be a little confusing because if you're compiling programs on one system, you know the same executable might exist in your home directory, but it might not run on all the systems because it's compiled. You know the systems all have different architectures and things, so. You just have to keep track. So when you log into any of these systems, though, you'll end up in your home directory, the path of which will be Glade U Home and then your username. Uh, you'll be able to put 50 gigabytes of stuff in that directory. Uh, all that stuff is backed up. So this is a good place to keep like code um, or you know analysis scripts and things like that. A better place to keep those things is like in GitHub. So they're like super backed up in the cloud. But in terms of like local things on the system, your home directory is backed up. If you accidentally delete files from there, they won't be lost. You can recover them. Uh, but it won't hold much stuff, only 50 gigabytes of data. So we have a larger space called work. Uh, work will allow you, allow you to store a terabyte of stuff. It is not backed up, though. So any changes to code you're making in work, unless you're backing them up some other way via GitHub or something, the data could be lost out of work. So just be careful. Um, but we do not actively purge work. Your, your one terabyte of data is yours to do with whatever, whatever you want you can put in there. Uh, we won't delete stuff. Scratch is a little scarier. So Scratch has 10 terabytes of space by default. Uh, it's pretty common for people to need more than 10 terabytes during some particularly big analysis. So you can, on request, say, oh, I need 50 terabytes, I need 100 terabytes. Um, and we'll usually bump that up for you for a period of several months to give you more space. But the thing about Scratch is it does get purged. So it's on a schedule where after a certain length of time, which I believe is 90 days right now, um, Stuff that hasn't been used for 90 days will be automatically deleted. So you just want to be aware, Scratch is not a good place to put data you want to keep around for a while. It's fine to do for a period of several months, um, but yeah, eventually that stuff will get deleted if you're not careful. And then there's some project spaces. Uh, those are available to you, just again, just to make you aware that this exists, but those are allocated when you're requesting um, you know, compute hours for a project. You can also request space for that project. Um, yeah, so let's see. So the campaign storage, one more space again. That's, that's a space that's sort of allocation only. So when you're requesting a project, you could say, I need some space on the campaign store, and you can get extra space there. Again, that's data that's expected to live sort of like on the timeline of three to five years, like the duration of a project. And then also these are, um, again, just sort of to raise your awareness. If you're doing some 
uh, experiments where you need a lot of data. We already have a lot of data resident on the system. So there's a bunch of stuff where you wouldn't have to go out and like download data, especially if it's relevant to you know, the earth science community generally. A lot of this is archived and available locally. So if you need some you know, data sets from NOAA or something, it's quite possible they already exist on the system. So go to the RDA website um, and you can get walked through a lot of the data sets that are curated and available. Uh, to get data in and out of Glade, like for short things, if you're like transferring a small tarball of stuff from your laptop up to the supercomputer, SCP and F SFTP, which are the file copying uh, versions of SSH, that's fine for small transfers. For really large transfers, though, that can be pretty slow. So if you're transferring, transferring you know, hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes up to the system, uh, we generally recommend Globus. Uh, there's a lot of ways to use Globus. You can install it on a laptop. Um, you can, many, most institutions these days, so other labs, other national labs or centers have Globus endpoints of their own. So transferring between, say, you know, NCAR and, you know, PSC or something, there's Globus endpoints. And the transfer between those two endpoints is very, very fast compared to another method. So for large data sets, I recommend Globus. And you can also put it on your laptop with Globus Connect Personal. Modules is how we uh, sort of present the user environment to you. So the, the available software on our systems is prevent, presented via modules. So those are all the things that we would expect users to use, things like compilers and debuggers and IO libraries. And the thing that modules does more than anything is it supports you know, lots and lots of software built, built against lots and lots of compilers and libraries. And it keeps the software that's in your environment consistent. So if you are using the Intel compiler, all the things that modules makes available to you will be compatible with the version of the compiler you're using. And one note, Cheyenne and Casper have different collections of modules. They should be similar, but there might be something on one that's not available on another. So you can request uh, augmentations if you need. These are the general commands you use to interact with modules. So module load or module unload will load or unload software. The syntax for that would be like, if I wanted to load the Intel compiler, I would say module load Intel. Pretty simple. Module avail uh, shows you um, what the loadable modules are. So everything that is consistent with your current environment that could additionally be loaded will show up with module avail. Uh, module list shows what you have loaded. Module purge wipes everything out and gives you a bare environment. Um, for some reason, I didn't put on the list uh, module reset. But see, if you did a module purge, or that would give you like a nothing environment. If you did a module reset, it would restore you to your default environment. You can also save sets of modules. So if you have some particular combination of software you use all the time, you probably want to save that. So you, you would save that as a collection by saying module save my collection. And then uh, you could do a module load, module restore uh, my collection. It would load all that software for you. And module spider, uh, it's kind of a weird name, but module spider and then some word will search all of the all of the um, module trees to see if that exists, whatever you're looking for. If it does exist, it'll tell you how to load it. The difference between avail and spider is avail shows you only things that are compatible with your current environment. Spider will search everything, so it will give you things that are not compatible uh, with your current environment, but tell you what you would have to do in order to use them. OK, and then this is just kind of a walking you through the process. So the first set of um, like the first rung in the tree of uh, uh, the module hierarchy is the compiler you're using. So like, for instance, if I had nothing loaded and I said what was available, it would say, oh, you have two versions of the Intel compiler and a version of the GNU compiler. I would choose to load one. And then if I loaded the Intel compiler, now if I didn't avail, it would show me things that are compatible with that. Uh, maybe I want to load an MPI library. And so if I loaded Intel and the MPT 2.19 library, then it would show me now you have PNET CDF available and it's been built with the, the MPI library and the compiler you used. So the things that are available there, like I said, compilers, uh, debugging tools and performance tools, MPI libraries, IO libraries, analysis languages, um, Python, Julia, things like that. Uh, I should say also in analysis languages, I probably should have mentioned, there's a module called Conda. I assume a lot of you are Python users, and we support Python mainly via Conda, so we have our own curated packages of Python libraries that are installed via Conda. So if you want to use what we provide, you would say module load Conda, and that'll load our Conda environment. And you can activate um, our base packages called NPL, the NCAR 
Python library. So after you did a module load conda, if you did conda activate NPL, it'll give you uh, what, you know, those are kind of the Python libraries that are most commonly requested around here. So it's a pretty good base set. Um, that's probably enough about software. A little bit about compiling. We have one module called in-car compilers, and that's kind of a nice convenience if you're building software because it does all the include path and the linking for you. So like if I want to use NetCDF in a Fortran program, if I do module load NetCDF, and then I also have the in-car compilers module loaded, I don't have to do a dash little L or a dash capital L to give paths or libraries. Um, that compiler wrapper will do all the including and linking for you. So it's a nice convenience. And then also, um, just be aware, as I mentioned a little earlier, Cheyenne and Casper have different CPU types. And in particular, Casper has some much more recent CPUs than Cheyenne. So it's possible to compile a program on Casper. Then if you accidentally run it on Cheyenne, you'll get an illegal instruction uh, because it has instructions that are not supported on Cheyenne. So just yeah, be aware if you're compiling the same thing on both systems, which version was compiled there. You might want to name it like you know, myprogram.casper, myprogram.cheyenne. Um, okay, so uh, what should you do with compute nodes? Why, why batch jobs and why compute nodes? These are where you would do things like run a model. Um, the stuff you're doing today and the rest of the week on CESM, the CESM scripts do a lot of what I'm about to describe automatically for you, so you won't have to interact with the batch system as intricately as I'm about to describe, but you know, this is kind of what's going on underneath the covers of CESM scripts too. So. Uh, so to use the batch system, from your workstation, you would connect to either the Cheyenne or the Casper login nodes. That gives you access to um, either to 4,000 batch compute nodes on Cheyenne or around 100 visualization nodes on Casper. And from there, you use PBS to start jobs on those systems. Um, so again, these are what a batch script would look like. CESM is creating these batch scripts and submitting them for you behind the scenes. But for other jobs, um, you might need to create your own batch scripts. Again, we have a lot of examples of this on our web page in the documentation tree. This is just showing you what they would look like. So these lines that start with a, a hash and then PBS, that's giving the batch scheduler some command. So, uh, and these two examples, by the way, are the same. One is in C shell and one is in bash. And if you don't care, by default, you get bash which would be over here. There's slightly different syntaxes. So, uh, the, you know, things are, whoops, sorry about that. The things happening in that batch script are basically like uh, where it says dash n, that's what I want to name my job. Dash a is the account I'm charging the job to. The dash l is how many resources I want. So here, this is a very simple job. I'm saying give me one node with one CPU and four gigabytes of memory. Uh, wall time, how long do I expect it to run, 10 minutes, et cetera. So pretty self-explanatory. Again, if you go to the web page, there's many, many examples of these types of, pro, um, of batch scripts on our website. And the main commands you use to interact with the scheduler uh, are qsub. That means to submit a batch job. So qsub, the name of a script, will submit a batch job to run. qstat will tell you if that job is waiting or running. Uh, qdel will delete a job, so if you've submitted a job and then you realize you made a mistake before it starts running, you could use qdel and the job ID to delete it. Qinteractive um, is a, like a helper script we have uh, that will basically start an interactive job for you on a compute node. That's handy sometimes if you just want like a, a node of your own to run some tests on, uh, but you want to do it interactively. And then qcmd uh, is like a, again, a little helper script we have that Anything you might type on the command line on a login node, uh, if you do qcmd dash a with the project and then dash dash, whatever you were about to run on a login node, uh, it'll schedule that to be run on a batch node instead. So uh, an example of usage for this is if you're compiling something uh, pretty intense like CESM, that takes many cores on the system and quite a bit of time to compile, you could do qcmd dash dash, you know, your cesm.build, they're going to tell you all about that later, but then that would schedule that compile to take place on a dedicated node instead of the login node. Uh, we can skip OpenMP. It exists, but probably won't need to know about it today. Command file jobs I'll mention quickly are, they're pretty handy. Um, this is intended for like if you have like a thousand files and you need to do the same uh, little bit of data analysis on each of those thousand files, Instead of writing a loop to do it sort of sequentially one file at a time, you could put all of that on a node and do like 36 of them at a time. 
Um, so running many copies of the same command on different pieces of data uh, can be done via command files. Again, lots of examples of that on our website. But so just to make you aware that that capability exists. Uh, for Casper, one thing, um, you know, if you recall my slide from the beginning, how chaotic Casper is, there's many, many different types of nodes with different CPUs, different GPUs, different numbers of CPUs and GPUs, et cetera. So on Cheyenne, you basically just submit a job and tell it how many nodes you want. On Casper, you have to be a little more careful about telling it exactly what you want. Um, you know, so like if you want GPUs, you have to request the GPU and optionally the type of GPU and the number of GPUs. Similar to the CPUs, you can, if you know you want a Cascade Lake CPU versus a Skylake CPU, uh, you can request all that. So an example here is just on this additional line I have where I'm saying GPU type equals V100 on Casper. That's going to make sure I get the type of GPU I want. And that's something you just need to pay a lot of attention to on Casper because there are lots of options. Uh, where your jobs run, by default, there's different queue names, but by default, regular is where you'd want to submit things on Cheyenne. That's kind of like your standard baseline. You have options from there. If you want to spend more money, uh, more <laughs> fake money, you know, accounting money, um, then you can get a job to start faster by putting it in the premium queue, but you're charged 50% extra to do that. Similarly, if you don't care exactly when something runs, uh, you can try the economy queue, and it, it'll typically still run. It won't start as fast, but it will. Uh, you'll get about a 30% discount. Then there's also the share queue. So if you don't want an entire node, if you want to use half a node or a third of a node, you can submit to the share queue. And the share queue is very, very cheap. Uh, it has a shorter wall clock limit to how long you can use a job there. Um, but you can use, yeah, a portion of a node. I should say all these other queues are the smallest slice you can get is one node. So even if you're only using one core, you'll be charged for a minimum of 36 cores in the other queues. And uh, one word on customizing your startup files. So because you have one home directory for all the machines, uh, if you're doing something like where you want one customization to your startup file to be done, but only when you're on Casper or only when you're on Cheyenne, you probably want to have some sort of block in your startup files like this if block here. This is an example where I'm saying, if I'm on Cheyenne, set my path to be this. And on else, you know, uh, else here would pretty much be Casper. That's the other machine you would have access to. Set it differently. Um, starting next month, there will be a window of a few months where we have Casper, Derecho, and Cheyenne. So you would probably want a slightly more complicated if block there. But you just you want to do something. If you want to have different settings for different machines, put some sort of if statements like this in your startup files. And then another word on uh, startup files. So um, I mentioned a little that you can save modules uh, as a set. So one of the sets is just your default set. So for instance, if you know you always use NCL, Python, NCO, and MKL, and that you want that to be your standard when you log in, load those and then say module save default, and that's now your default. So when you log into the system, that's what will be loaded. Um, and you can make more than one set, but only one default, but you can make other named sets if you want. But if you set your default to whatever packages you use the most often, uh, that's our recommend way, recommended way to do it. Uh, we see a lot of people that put module load commands in their startup files, and that can lead to some really weird effects, um, and it's particularly like on batch nodes or sometimes using SCP to copy data, it'll, it'll be going through your uh, module, your startup file, and it'll see a module command. And modules do a lot of output to standard error, just informational output that isn't errors, but that'll interrupt commands like SCP a lot. So we get a lot of people that can't transfer data, and you trace it back, and the root cause is because they have module load commands in their startup files. So just a caution not to do that. If you want to change the default software you have, use these module save commands. SAM um, is your interface to our accounting. So when you run a job, you get charged some amount of core hours for it. If you wanted to check how many core hours you have left or how expensive it was to run a job, you do it through SAM. So that's sam.ucar.edu. You authenticate with your same duo. Uh, you can change a few settings there. Like you could change your default shell, for instance, there. Um, but it's mainly informational. So you can see a history of your jobs and a history of what you were charged for those jobs. Uh, through Sam. Okay, and that's um, that's all I have. I'm back to my first slide, which again is still the most important slide I have. This is how you contact us, um, mainly through uh, help if you want to submit a ticket. Um, I should say too, you know, since a lot of the consultants are virtual these days, like I myself live in Breckenridge now, so 
We are not on site all the time uh, to do face-to-face -face talks, but we can schedule face-to-face -face talks or we can also schedule Zoom sessions and stuff. But again, if you want to do that, probably the easiest way is to start by submitting a help ticket. Uh, you'll get assigned to a consultant. And then if you want to actually talk to us on a phone or a Zoom session or schedule a day to be in person, we can do that through there too. And also the documentation is pretty good these days. So feel free to browse the docs for other questions. All right, let's thank Rory. And um, does anyone have any quick questions? Because we're going to jump into the lab sessions, so some of this might get resolved there, but it looks like there's just a couple quick ones, and then Kate is going to give us a talk, too. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Very quick clarifying question. Uh, so when you talk about the partition, you said that only the shared partition we can like share across in one node. Does that mean that if we use other three one, if we claim one node, actually we, we should always claim all the cores, right? Yeah, if you're going to use a node, this is, and that's particularly on Cheyenne. On Casper, shared usage is supported more. But on Cheyenne, it's really meant to, if you ask for one node, uh, you're going to be the only job on that node. So even if you say, you can start a job on Cheyenne where you say, I want a single core, but it's going to give you your own node, and it's going to charge you as if you were using all 36 cores. So if you're running a, any sort of job on Cheyenne, uh, it's in your best interest to use all the cores. There are reasons why you occasionally might not want to, like for instance, some jobs um, require a lot of memory, and so you might only use 18 of the cores, but still use all of the memory on the node. That's fine um, if you just need to do it also to get more memory for one core. But yeah, generally, for, in terms of how you're charged, it's assuming you're going to use all, all 36 cores. Uh, hi, thank you for your presentation. So I was wondering, uh, so is there any time limit for the Q Interactive? So time uh, or resource limitations for that? There um, is. I think so Q Interactive is just a script. And I think by default, it gives you six hours. You can extend it with an argument up to 12 hours, which is the default for all the queues. Or you could make it shorter if you know you only want to use it for an hour. You could do you know, one hour. Okay. So that's just uh, an argument. Okay. Another question is like, so uh, for the job uh, batch script, it's like, is there any maximum limit of the time? Like some HPCs, they have like, you can go all the way up until four days. So do we have any such limitations? Our default is 12 hours. Um, you know, and so if, if, for instance, you think you need to run for two days and you submit a help ticket to me and says, hey, I need to run for two days, I can enable that, uh, but I would push back on you first to say, why isn't your job able to checkpoint? So that's, that's the expected behavior is the scheduler is more efficient at scheduling. You know, 12 hours is a pretty good chunk where you, it's long enough of an integration that you're getting sort of good bang for your buck in terms of like startup overhead. Um, but you're also saving state frequently enough and stopping your job frequently enough to get other people a chance to get in the queue also. Um, so yes, it's technically possible, but you really have to have a reason, like, this is why my job cannot write output and restart from that output later, so, which does occur, so it's possible. All right. Um, we're going to move to a, just a quick introduction for uh, what we're doing this morning and this afternoon, I left my and um, that's going to be given by Kate Thayer Calder, right. who um, is a software engineer. She works on the community ice sheet model and the community atmosphere model. So um, let me just open this. Oh. Um, I will open them. And I will... While I open this, I will get um, the website open. All right. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, okay, so we have it, have it open here. And then, um, okay, let's go ahead and pull that up. Here it is right here. Perfect. That's what I want. All right. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Alice. Uh, yeah, my name is Kate there Calder. I'm going to be helping you guys with your tutorial exercises this afternoon. I'll be running between labs and answering questions. Um, I just wanted to show. Well, I wanted to go over the basics of CESM workflow. So today in your lab exercise, what you're going to do is you're going to download the CESM code, you're going to set up your environment, and you're going to set up an experiment, build that experiment, run that experiment, and take a look at the output. So it's a lot to do on your first day, but we're going to get you all dive right in. Um, this gives you a quick overview of what we're expecting for you today, and it's basically what I just said, but broken down into a little bit more specific steps. 
And you can see up there at the top, I don't know, do I have a pointer? I do. Um, this is the link to the quick start workflow for CSM2. So you should have both the tutorial um, documentation, which is very well written and very thorough, as well as uh, options to take a look at the documentation that exists on the web for CSM previously. So basically, what I said before, we're going to be downloading the code, um, and then we're going to be creating a new case invoking case setup, building the executable, running the model, and reviewing the output data. And I'm going to go over this just a little bit more. I'm going to try not to get into too much detail here because, again, you guys are going to be going over all of this in the, tutor in the, the exercises, and I want you to get a chance to get to that. So we want you to be aware, first of all, of how to set up your CESM workspace. And there are four main paths that we talk about in our product, project. Um, the first one is the path to your source code. So I've got this like little greenhouse here, and you see it's sort of a color-coded thing in the tutorial documentation as well. And that's where you're going to download and put the CESM code that you get from GitHub. And then the next important path is the case directory. So a lot of times people will create a case directory in like their home directory, as Rory was talking about, or possibly in your work directory if you need more space for your code. Um, and that's where you're going to set up all of your experiments, which we call cases. Um, and then you're going to have um, build and run directories. So this is where the code, once it's built, it goes to, and where your output goes to first. And most of this goes into your scratch directory on Cheyenne. Um, so that's, again, a third space. And then the fourth space is the archive. So by default, CESM will take all of the history files and move them to another directory, usually on Scratch, called archive. So you need to know where that data goes. So this is a quick overview of downloading CESM. I'm not going to get into all of this. It's in the tutorial. It'll show you the command that you use, but we check it out from GitHub, and then we check out a tag so that you have the right code there. Um, once you have the code downloaded, you're going to run a program called Manage Externals, Check Out Externals. And that gets you the rest of the code. So CESM is basically just a list of all of the places where it's going to look for code. And then once you run Manage Externals, that actually goes to all those places and brings it into your source directory so that you have it available to use. This is a quick look once you get your CSM code as an example. Um, so this uh, particular place is where we used to keep it, tutorial, um, that would be the basic root directory for your source code. And if you look into that after you've run manage externals, you'll see a seam, seam config, and component subdirectories. Those are probably the um, seam and components are probably the most important for your basic um, first day. So under components, you're going to take a look and you can see all of the different components of CESM. So already this morning, I'm sure you've heard from Gokhan and others about how CESM is a hub and spoke architecture. Okay. <laughs> Well, you used to. <laughs> um, and it has several different models included in the CESM um, constellation. CAM is a community atmosphere model. Sea ice is our sea ice model. SISM is the ice sheet model. Um, CLM in CSM 2.1, which you guys are going to be using here, is what we call the land model. It does have an updated name in the more recent versions. Um, Mozart was the river model. Um, POP is the ocean model for CESM 2.1. Um, and then uh, there's an RTM river transport model as well, and a Wave Watch 3. So SEAM uh, is short for the Common Infrastructure for Modeling the Earth. And this is a huge package of mostly Python scripts that we use to manage all of our experiments and set up and infrastructure jobs in CESM. Um, so the important parts of SEAM, you can go, like this shows you, you go into the SEAM directory and take a look and you can see this is the basic listing for that directory, um, is that it includes the coupling infrastructure, so our coupler is held in there. Um, there are data and stub models, so if you don't want to use an active model for your experiment, then that's where the data and stub models exist. There's testing infrastructure, which software engineers uh, use heavily. And then the Python scripts for managing XML configuration and input data, things like that are all held in this particular subdirectory. So we've been sort of going through a really quick quick start here. Um, like I mentioned before, we'd want to make a place to hold your cases first. And then we would download our C CESM um, and go into the SEAM script subdirectory. And the first thing that you do when you're creating an experiment is you call this create new case um, function. And that creates the, the ex basic experiment that you want to run with CSM. So the create new case command requires three arguments. The first one is to give it a case name. So that's whatever you want to call your case. And our tutorial will give you examples of that. 
Um, but there's a lot of suggestions for how to give cases a descriptive and helpful name so that you can look back at the directory and have an idea of what you're looking at there. You're going to need to know right off the bat which resolution you want to use. And then you want to know what your model configuration you want to use, which set of active components that is. And that's called a comp set. Um, so in the tutorial, it'll give you examples of places to go to look at to see all the different comp sets that are available and different model configurations and how those work with the resolutions and things along those lines. I can't get into that now. But <laughs> uh, for your first day, you're going to be creating a B comp set, which means all of the components are active in your case. And then um, sometimes you can specify which machine you're working on. Um, CSM is really good at recognizing Cheyenne. So you don't actually have to specify Cheyenne when you're on there, which is where you'll be today. Um, once you've created that case, so in this case, uh, Chris made a case, a subdirectory in home, his home directory, and then he created his case into this b.day1. Um, then you can take a look at what's in your case, and you can see all of these different scripts and XML files and um, subdirectories. So this is what a CSM experiment looks like right off the bat. And the first thing that you need to do once you have this, it is set up out of the box to run a default B case. So we're not going to make too many changes right off the bat. But if you wanted to make changes, these are the different XML files that are available to make those changes in different steps and spaces of your um, experiment. So uh, you can make changes to where you want to archive your data, how you want to um, change your batch settings done with the XML file any changes that you want to make to your build, um, specific case um, options are set in this file, but you shouldn't modify it. Uh, changes to the PE layout or the system, uh, the system architecture, say like how, which nodes and how many uh, processing elements on those nodes that you're using are done in this PE, ENV machine PEs. And I'm getting too into this, I'm going to keep moving. Um, so if you want to see a variable in an XML file, you need to use the script XML query. And one of the best little tricks here is XML query dash P. So if you can't remember exactly what you're looking for, like you want to look up the time that your experiment is set to use. You want to know how long it's going to, it's, it's reserved to run for. You don't remember exactly what the XML variable is for time. So you could just put an XML query dash P, all capitals T-I-M-E. And it'll show you all the XML variables that have the word time in them. And then in there somewhere, there's going to be the XML variable that's job underscore wall clock time. And that's the one you're looking for. So you'll see this in your um, test or your, your tutorial as well. Um, once you have your case directory, the next command you need to call is case setup. And this goes through and sets up all of the name list options. It creates the run directory and exe directories. Uh, this is one of your third. Um, workspaces, it usually goes into your scratch directory by default on, C, on uh, Cheyenne. Um, and it creates user nameless files that you can use to override the default nameless as well. And it creates your case.run and case.st um, archive scripts, which are used to run the model later. Once you've done your setup, then you're going to call qcmd case.build. So as Rory was just saying, you don't want to build CESM from a login node. Sizzle gets really upset about that, and you get thrown off the machine in an angry email saying, don't do that. <laughs> they don't, Rory will not probably show up at your desk, <laughs> but it's, you know, they just don't like it. So we use QCMD to make it happen. Um, that actually sends case.build to a batch uh, node, so it's not interrupting everybody else's usage of the machine. Um, and if you have a default project already, you don't need the dash A, um, but you, you will have that option once you get into the tutorial. I had a slide that showed all of the output from this, but man, it is a lot, so we're skipping over that. Um, and once the model successfully builds, then the last thing you do is you call case.submit, and that will submit your job to the batch queue to run. So once you're done, and you can check the status of that with a QStat command, as Rory was saying, um, and you can keep an eye on it for when it's finished. Once it's done, you can also look at your case status file. And this will show you everything that you've done so far. So the case status file is a really nice way to ensure reproducibility of your experiments, which is very important. It keeps track of everything that you've done to your experiment so far. So you can see that uh, it has the case setup. It actually has um, case build. 
in the case submit in here as well. And then any changes that you make to XML variables using XML change will show up in this file as well. So it's why you should always use XML change so that it keeps track of everything that you've done so far. And you can go back to somebody and they can say, well, you know, what did you set this particular XML variable to? You know, how often were you writing restart files? Uh, what changes did you make to your PE layout? That's all could be show up in this file if you use XML change when you do it. So uh, that's the end of what I've got here. There's a few slides here about information and getting help. I want to point out the uh, Discuss CESM um, forums. This is a really nice uh, community place to go and ask questions um, or search to see if other people have had the same issues as you are having right now, because most people probably have. <laughs> and uh, you can see the solutions to those and the threads that people have already asked questions for. And if you don't see yours, you can post it. And we do actually check this and keep track of those questions and help to answer people when they post. Um, and then also here is the tutorial. So this has been a really good resource. You guys can go back and check and see everything that we've talked about. And it gives you a good uh, overview of how to use uh, CSM for all of your needs. So uh, we're just running a little bit late. In the tutorial, your first, um, we are right now in basics. So everything that I just went over is described here. So you can see there's workspaces. Here's the CSM code. and talks about how to download the code. And then here's the workflow where I talked about the new case, the setup, the build, and submit scripts. And it goes into all of those in a lot of detail. So you should go over this. And then here is your exercise. So this is what you're going to be working through today. Um, it gives you learning goals, and you're going to set up your first CSM run here. Cool. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much, Kate. So what we're going to do for this first morning, we're, like she said, we're going to start with basics. And um, I'm going to put up the website here in a minute. I also sent it to you in one of the prerequisite slides uh, or emails. So if you didn't get that, you can let me know. Um, the goal for this morning, it's 1120, is we have some helpers. Can the helpers come up here? We got... Meg and Cecile, who's not yet up here, and Anna, and um, Kate, who we just saw, and Sam, and then Peter over here. So these are the helpers for now. There might be the different ones this afternoon. But we're going to split ourselves up. Just We're going to go halfway this half of the room, roughly. You're going to go up to the library. And then this half of the room, actually, we'll do it like here. This half of the room, go to the library. And this half of the room, go to the Damon room. And we're going to split up. The goal for the morning is to download the code. And then maybe, depending how familiar you are with GitHub um, and whatnot, you might start building this new case. So that's the goal for today, to start working on that. And this morning, um, like I said, we're going we're gonna to go to those different rooms. Um, we can make sure to email this. This should be a default when you use your dot .profile um, that we tell you to use. But the account we're using is UESM0012. And then we have a reservation. This is for the afternoon only when we um, actually start running. We think this morning it'll probably mostly be downloading the code. The other thing I want to point out, we'll meet back in here at 1. Um, I would not leave my stuff in here. It's open to the public, and it probably won't get stolen, but it might. So I'll take it with you. Um, and in that case, I guess we'll see you back here at 1. <laughs>